Two programs. Two programs we're giving away right now. MAPS Aesthetic, MAPS Performance. Those are also the programs that are 50% off right now. But one of you is going to get both for free. By the way, it's a great combination, right? MAPS Performance trains you like an athlete. So it's uh, unconventional exercises. You move in different planes of motion. Focuses on mobility and performance. Basically, it's all go. It's about the go, right? MAPS Aesthetic, well, that's all about the show. That's a bodybuilder style program. Build muscle, sculpt your body, develop areas that are lagging, and you can actually combine both programs and get a phenomenal, well-balanced workout. But anyway, here's how you can win both programs. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Uh, you know, Full disclosure, helps us with the YouTube algorithm. We're trying to win the game here. So do that. Also, subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. Do all of those things, and then if we pick your comment, we'll notify you, and you'll get free access to both. Now, everybody else... Both programs are 50% off right now. If it's MAPS Performance you're interested in, go to mapsgreen.com. If it's MAPS Aesthetic you're interested, go to mapsblack.com. The code for both for 50% off is FEB50. So FEB50 gives you half off one or both of those programs. Okay? Here comes the show. A lot of people know cortisol to be the stress hormone, but a lot of people don't know is that cortisol often feels good, and this is probably why many people overtrain. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Remember we call those uh, cortisol junkies. Cortisol yeah. junkies. Yeah. You know what's funny? I, you know what I first heard that Energizer. was actually from a doctor that I trained. Oh, really? Yeah. I, was, I had a client that was a doctor, and we would talk about the you know how a lot of people just get addicted to exercise. And I'd say, yeah, a lot of people, they just feel terrible, but they still go and train themselves super hard. And they get that short window of feeling good afterwards. And he goes, oh, it's the cortisol. Mm. And I said, what? And he goes, yeah, cortisol. I mean, it's, it's a stress hormone because what it does is it gets your body to release energy right away. Mm. Now, too much cortisol over time causes muscle breakdown, can cause fat storage, obviously is a stress adaptation. But in the short term, it causes this energy release. And he said, yeah, these people, you know, over time, their body probably becomes... Not unlike insulin insensitivity, right? When you start to lose sensitivity to insulin or develop insulin resistance, lots of cortisol over time probably starts to lose its effect. And so you're overtrained all the time, overworked. The same people, right? They don't sleep very good, a lot of coffee, mm -hmm. high stress. They tend to be late often to appointments. They also train their butts off and they love the workouts because they're like, but I just love the way it makes me feel even though they're obviously overdoing it. Well, this is why, too, like you'll find it's usually higher in the morning, right? And that's mm. something that's more advantageous, get you up, get you going, that stress hormone kicks in, and then it's not advantageous for you. No. <laughs> like, especially when you get towards, uh, you know, sundown and starting to calm down. But, uh, yeah, it becomes it comes one of those feelings you seek out uh, once you get into these high-intensity type of exercises. Did you guys find, like, a common theme? With the clients that, yep. like, what are what are some of the things? I, I felt the same thing too. I'm just curious if you guys are on the same. Oh, it's just the, the avatar is like this, right? They mm -hmm. they overtrain. That's obvious. We're talking about that. Super demanding job. Yes, high high performing, high stress job. Or like five kids. Yeah, lot, yeah, yeah lots of kids. kids. Yeah, that's which like is a demanding job. I mean, <laughs> that's why I said. Honest, it's yeah. a, I mean, that, that's a job you don't get time off, uh, right? So you got that. Um, they don't sleep very well. Lots of caffeine typically, and oftentimes to help them at night. Wine, or yeah, exactly alcohol something to bring, to bring them, down. them down, which yeah would yeah. typically be. Alcohol. And they navigate; they they tend to gravitate, I should say, towards uh, Orange Theory or CrossFit or HIT training or circuit training. Mm -hmm. They have 15 pounds of body fat that's stubborn; they can't figure out why it won't come off. They cut their calories. Why aren't this working? Oh, I know. I just need to work out harder. So now, explain this a little bit. So, so what is going on here? Correct me if I'm wrong. That you have somebody who is. Those are all the things you're listing. These are all like, uh, you know, some lower level, some higher level stresses on the body. And so what's happening is, is and many times, I don't know if you said it, but many times this is also low calorie people, right? People yep. that are trying to restrict or cut back that they're taking on all these insults that the body has just gotten used to just constantly being on the mm -hmm. defense. And so it starts to lower its cortisol production. Is that what is happening? And so- In extreme cases, now that, when that happens now, you're in really big trouble. But, but what might happen is, and this can happen with many hormones, right? If the hormones are, if a hormone is really high all the time, your mm -hmm. body starts to become somewhat, for lack of a better term, desensitized to it. So receptors will either downregulate or it's not as effective. This is kind of what happens with insulin resistance. 
you know, before you get diabetes or prediabetes, uh, you can track and see insulin levels going up and up with the consumption of sugars or carbohydrates. And people um, don't realize what's going on until, uh oh, I have full blown insulin resistance. And then they go into, you know, type 2 diabetes. With this cortisol, it's just this high cortisol all the time. And at first, you kind of get the, and we've all been there, right? We're stressed, but we have kind of this wired energy. Mm -hmm. So maybe lack of sleep, but there's stressful stuff going on and we feel kind of energized, but it's this wired kind of energy. That can come from cortisol along with catecholamine production and other stress chemicals. Um, and over time, your body starts to lose sensitivity. So then you want to push out more of this and you tend to seek out things that make you produce more cortisol. And one of those is these super high intense workouts. The, another one that I find is very interesting is oftentimes these same people will find themselves chronically be rushing or late to yeah. appointments, which I love bringing that up because people will look at me like I'm some kind of well, it's in the subconscious. Like, you know? oh. Yeah, like it's almost like it's a self sabotaging kind of a mechanism where it, it you do get a rush from being late, and all of a sudden you have to figure everything out, um, you know, on the spot. And I and I feel like that you do get a bit of that same kind of a rush uh, that you get from something high intensity exercise wise. So now, what I found with these clients, these are actually some of the hardest clients to get through to. Hundred percent. Um, because they're already uh, everything that they've accomplished in their life usually was from hard grinding work, right? Well, and they probably got there, you know, initially like they lost weight and they they saw some result from doing high intensity workouts, but mm -hmm. have never left. Well, and they also, it's hard to tell somebody who honestly feels better, feels good, right, from these types of workouts immediately after that it's not good for them. Mm -hmm. Like that, that, I always found that the, one of the most challenging things. Like, and this, this was really common, right? When I was coaching at Orange Theory, uh, and this was really common when the the rise of CrossFit, right? When more and more people were doing that type of training, and even when HIT was popularized. But what happens is you get somebody who does these things, and they they truly do like it, be, and because they get this sense of accomplishment, they sweat really hard. Yeah. It was really, and they got through it. And they get that spike of cortisol, so they get the spike of energy afterwards. And so they're very certain that they like this way of training because it makes them feel good. It was really hard as a coach to get through to that person and be like, no, this is not what's good for you. And they're going, no, yes, it is. I can tell it's good. I mean, it gives me more energy. Yeah. I get the I'm I kick I kick the, you know, the day and it's you know, I do great, you know, I kick off the day and I have a great day because kick of the it. Day like, the dick? Is yeah, I, yeah, I was gonna say that. <laughs> I got you. Don't I chose worry. not to say <laughs> that. Matt Vincent has a couple for that. Yeah. <laughs> that was what was going through my head. There's a, there's a more appropriate way for me to say that. <laughs> don't worry about it. I got that. But you know what I'm saying? Like the dick. that's what these people the it's really hard to get them out of it because they've either had success through training this way or they feel a certain way from it and it makes them feel good. The challenge is they do feel good or better temporarily in the context of how crappy they usually feel, right? So what tends to happen is you start to feel bad over time and that's how you always feel. And then you have a new definition of what feels good. The reality is, is if they could feel the contrast of what real good feels like, they would see that what they're getting is a nervous, anxious, wired kind of energy. Not unlike, again, like we've all experienced this, lack of sleep. Like, you know, how about like when you first had your son? Remember when you first had your son yeah. and you weren't sleeping, but you were you were energized and you're yeah. like, oh, no, I got plenty of energy. What, yeah. Really what it was, it was this. Was high. Yeah. yeah uh -huh. You know? So it's hard. It's really hard to reverse them out of it. And I think the only winning formula that I had for that was when they would finally get fed up with lack of results. Mm -hmm. When they got to the point where they're like, I don't understand why I can't lose 15 pounds. That's, I'm doing everything and I'm eating so little. What the hell's going on? That's the only way that I could get through to this person. Yep. Was what I'd explain to them is that, okay, you, if you're certain you love it, this is where you want to be. Um, and if you're completely happy where you're at, energy, strength, muscle, your body shape, body fat percentage, whatever, if you're happy where it's at, then by all means, let's keep doing it. Yeah. But if you come to me and you say, Adam, I want to change this. If I want to build some muscle, I want to be stronger. I want to have more energy. I want to lose body fat. And you're struggling to 
hit any of those goals, then I'm going to tell you what you're doing is not what we should be mm-hmm. doing. So that And that would be the only way that I could break through to them is obviously it's not working. You have this goal you have not achieved. It's not that you need to do it more and longer or harder to get there. You don't need, you can, we, there's a way to work with your body. Instead, we're working against it right now. Whether you believe it or not, you are. And if you want to make changes, then we have to change the way you're going yeah. about it. That would be my only way to break through. Yeah. Do you guys remember in your early days of training when you started to really see this or notice this as a thing? Like, I remember distinctly, this was, I mean, I was an early trainer. This was the uh, 24 Fitness on Hillsdale before they redid it, right? So this was a while ago. And I remember there were, obviously there was a room for the aerobics classes. And I remember there was this class and it was a, you know, quote unquote resistance training class, but really it wasn't. What it was, was high intensity circuit training for an hour. Pump classes. Yeah. It was like an hour of, of intense, you know, squats and pushups and dumbbell laterals and, you know, donkey kick, man. It was just nonstop intense. And I remember when I first became a trainer, I saw this class and I saw this room full of 40 people doing it. And most of them were middle-aged women um, who were taking this class. And I remember thinking like, wow, these women are going to get great results. Like this is when I was an early trainer, so I really didn't understand this. And then I watched this class because it was during a time when I had a client. And it was the same women coming in, coming in, coming in. And I remember seeing them sweat and work hard and nobody was progressing. I remember thinking, could they just be eating a ton of food and have a really bad diet? Like what's going on here? Mm -hmm. And I'd see them not change, not change. Well, eventually... I figured, you know, I would, I would find ways of getting into these classes so I could potentially talk to new, get new clients. So obviously as a trainer, I was trying to get a new trainer. I was trying to get new clients and I'd go in and start talking to these people. And I'd find out some of these women were taking this class for a year, yeah, two years. And then I'd say, you know, is it your diet? You must be eating a lot of calories. Like, oh no, I, I count my cow. I had one woman pull out. She had a, in her workout bag, she had, this is back in the day when people would write, you know, things on paper and she had a notebook. She goes, no, I'm eating 1,200 calories a day. And she was showing me the food. And I remember being totally confused. How is this even possible? It's mind boggling. The, the, I had the same experience, but it was with like the Group X instructor. Yeah. And I saw mm. them in there with multiple classes sweating profusely and then would come in and like work out. And I would see them like putting so much work in. And this is back when I uh, was in the mentality of, of just, if you keep putting work in, you get a uh, return for that. Mm-hmm. And it, it was just like, I, I didn't even know how to explain it. Cause even one of my clients asked me why they weren't, you know, in phenomenal shape. And I'm like, I don't know. I had the same thing. I'm like, maybe they're sneaking in a bunch of cupcakes or something. I, don't, I have no idea. <laughs> no, that was, a, so I trained, um, that was my experience was training actually group X instructors. Ooh, they, they're hard. Yeah, no, they were really hard. And I mean, and that was the the first time that it kind of, the first like aha moment, um, that there was something else going on here, you know, because it wasn't a calorie thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, shit, they were, they should have been burning, you know, 10,000 plus calories a day. Based, I mean, I had group X instructors that were teaching three plus classes in a day, uh-huh. you know, so three Three hours or four hours of intense, you know, cardio like training every single day, and they were just stuck. Their yeah. body would not change. And they, you know, and their thought was, oh, I picked up the body pump class too. So I'm lifting the weights, you know? Yeah. So they're lifting the weights. They're doing the cardio classes like crazy. I started holding dumbbells when I yeah. go running. So yeah. Oh, totally. Everything I mean, fast. Literally, yeah. these, those, those were things that they were doing as a strategy. And uh, and then I look at their food log, and they were they're eating nowhere near uh, a high amount of calories. Yeah. So that was kind of the I had, first experience. I, for I me. was so confused. I had an experienced trainer that I looked up to uh, that worked with me, and I asked them. I said, "What's going on? Do people just lie?" And he said, "Well, sometimes they do." He goes, "But usually they don't." And he says, "You know, if your body doesn't want to do something." You're not going to be able to force it to do what you think you want it to do. And I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, the body has this incredible ability, and this is totally true, has this incredible ability to change and manipulate its metabolism and hormones and even drivers of behavior. So cravings or energy or lack of energy or drive or lack of drive in order to get, in order to do what it thinks it needs to do in order to survive, right? So here you are beating yourself up like crazy, probably not getting good sleep, doing all the stuff that we talked about, um, low calories, and your body's like, we need to survive. We are expen- we're, we're moving like crazy. We're not eating much. There's a lot of stress. So what it does is it organizes its hormones and it organizes how it operates. 
And it can literally, there's a huge swing of how many calories your body could decide to burn on its own, depending on what's going on. And some of that is directed through hormones. And there's a lot of stuff that we don't fully understand. And it's pretty remarkable. I mean, later on in my career, when I really figured this out, I would get clients like this. And so long as they complied, I remember I had one lady and I've talked about her before. She was working out all the time, running daily, dropping her calories, had another 10 pounds to lose. I mean, it was it was a ridiculous amount of activity and low calories. It was 1,200 calories a day, if I'm not mistaken. She was working out seven days a week, which included some resistance training, mostly lots of running, Pilates, yoga. So she was doing all kinds of crazy stuff. She hired me. Over the course of a year, she went down to three days a week of resistance training with one day a week of running. So she got down to four days a week of exercise, probably one third of the total amount of activity. And she was eating over 2,300 calories. So we got her to burn that almost, more than a thousand more calories a day and working out one third of the yeah. amount of time because we had got her body to want to right. be leaner. And this is the thing. And, and the, the other thing that'll happen if you keep pushing your body is eventually it'll shut down or become injured uh, as a way to get you to stop. And you see this quite often. Well, I think mm -hmm. the important part of this conversation is to understand too that there, there's a spectrum here. That we're kind of highlighting like the extreme, right? Low calorie, yeah. and so there's people going like, "Oh, well, that's not me. I mean, I'm not, I'm not doing, you know, 800 calories, and I'm not doing seven days a week, you know, four hours a day. I'm not that person." Yeah, that's right? the extreme, right? Right. Or oh, I don't have five kids, or I don't have a crazy stressful job, so this can't be me. But that we're we're highlighting the extreme version of that. But the, it's a spectrum, and there's a lot of people that are on that side, mm -hmm. and the middle is the sweet spot, you know, because then you can be the other extreme. You don't do enough, right? <laughs> you eat too much. You don't do enough movement. You don't do enough mm -hmm. training. You don't put enough stress in your life, so you're seeing minimal to no results. So there's that end of the spectrum. Then they have this this crazy end, and they have everybody in the middle of that. And where we really want to be is right in that kind of middle yes. balance. But there's a lot of people that are to the right of that still that. They're, they're taking on a lot of stress and simply by just scaling back on the stress or maybe increasing calories and feeding the body or changing the adaptation. So this high intensity type of training, maybe do something more like strength sets where I'm, you know, straight sets and long rest periods and, you know, maybe focus on recovery more a little bit. Like, so there's a lot yeah. of people that would see more results just simply by modifying or changing the way they're going about oh, it. Oh yeah, and a lot of times they're just they just got good at it. It's something that they that's why they enjoy it. It's like their body adapted to this way of training and they they associate all these benefits to it. Uh, you know, energy wise and whatnot, but they're not progressing. Their body's like fully adapted in this way of training yep. to where it's starting to kind of uh, have negative um, uh, uh, differences going forward. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, think of it this way, right? All the hormones that people, you know, want to improve or increase, right? Testosterone, growth hormone, like these are the, the, the youth hormones, right? Uh, balance of estrogen or progesterone in women. Um, you want to have good insulin sensitivity. Um, that's very good for you. All of that stuff leads the body towards more energy expenditure. So all of that, in combination with the right type of exercise, adds active tissue to your body, uh, aka muscle, which means now you have a higher caloric requirement. Okay, so if your body organizes its hormones in this way, the way that most of us want, we want to feel younger rejuvenated. We want to burn body fat, build muscle, recover faster, all that stuff. But in order for that to happen, because remember that results in higher caloric expenditure all the time. It, it, it results in more lean body mass. In order for that to happen, your body has to think it's safe to do so. Otherwise, why the hell would it? Why, If you were the manager of your body, if you're like in this Imagine this like like Star Trek, right? You're like in this room operating all these machines and then you're having a meeting with your other operators of the body and you're like, hey, we want to increase the size of the engine. Uh, we can't do that. We're not, we don't have enough energy. We're expending way too much. We need to conserve, organize everything in a way to continue to conserve. We can't do that. Or if they come and you say, hey, we need, uh, let's make the engine bigger. And he's like, well, let's look at the, More the logs. More <laughs> Yeah, let's look at the logs. Okay, no, we got plenty of energy Looks like we're cool. Looks like there's more energy coming in or in the future because we don't have this history of 
no energy. Everything looks cool. It's not stressful. Let's do it. Let's throw a bigger engine on. Let's make this happen. Meanwhile, Romulans are shooting lasers yeah. at you. Yeah. And lasers you know, on Taking stun. onslaughts of yeah. stress yeah. everywhere. <laughs> I, I love that. So good. Hey, I wanted to ask you, Jess, I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay. Uh, obviously, you were in a bad mood today uh, all day long. Because <laughs> of his haunted house? Because well, yeah. I mean, he, he bought a haunted house? He walks in. Justin's not, <laughs> Justin's not a man of many words, but he's yeah. a, he's a, you could feel his- Where's his emotions? His, I, yeah, you know, that's the problem. Well, I guess it's the you what you see is what you get, right? Yeah. So you guys like call it immediately. I can't hide it. It's yeah. just like how it is. Like I was a little annoyed this morning. Uh, well, I was woke up early and, and went to the high school and was training the kids and just I do that like Monday and Wednesdays mm -hmm. typically now and I try to kind of devote some time to that. And so I went down there and like I get this call and I actually noticed a bit of water and I thought maybe we'd left the sprinklers on overnight like too long or something and then like there was just where know, was puddles. The, where was the water? Don't you so, have artificial lawn? Yeah, I do. <laughs> it wasn't on the lawn. You're well, yeah. okay. <laughs> so it, it made its way to the lawn but like, <laughs> like I thought that, that was been Weird. That should have been your first <laughs> red flag. It was Man, weird. She's, she's overwatering that artificial yeah. turf. Like, like honey, you're getting a little crazy with us here. Uh, yeah. So, it, but everywhere else, it was. It just looked like it was watering the plants. And um, so I get this phone call, like, oh my god, you know, a pipe bust. And it, it, I get this video, and it's just spraying everywhere. And so I'm like, I'll be there in a minute. That's this morning. Yeah. Oh. And so I just bail and leave. I mean, we're literally five minutes away from the school so i just zh, zip right back up and um in this huge um windmill that's like in my front yard um it houses uh, this water pump and everything that kind of does everything and so one of the pipes just broke and burst and it was just like <laughs> floods just everywhere and i'm in there ah like trying to see and assess what it is and i run over to go shut the main water off and um yeah, so it, it, by that time it had like like flooded the entire front yard. So and that's gonna be a fun build. You got a, pl you got a plumber coming over? The, yeah. That'll What's that? Depressing. You got a plumber coming? To yeah. Fix so I shut it off and then I left and called, you know, and got a guy out to fix it. But dude, it's just the thing is this house. I love it, dude. It's like it totally fits our needs. It's in like such a rad spot. Like, but it wants to. It, it wants to destroy itself. I'm convinced, dude. Like first, you had first it tried to, to set itself on fire. Yeah. yeah. Then it tried to flood itself. Yes. Now Taunted, wasn't dude. Now wasn't now. <laughs> hold on. What didn't the previous property there? Did, wasn't it like it caught fire? Did someone die in it? But the whole house burned down. So bro. yeah, and then I had that weird occurrence, and then yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm still. <laughs> it's a haunted house, bro. Didn't dude. someone die in it? Is that what happened? Yeah, somebody died in it. Oh but, my um, god! Fucking Doug was old lady, and it was great. And she passed, and everything was fine, and we saved. Oh the yeah, house she bullshit. She's still there stuff, trying to get bro. you guys out. Hold on, was it know, built? She likes us, dude. I don't know about that. What, I think it's something else. Was dude. it built on an ancient burial ground? That's, or did we look it, that it might go further, right? It oh, might go way god. back, uh, <laughs> you know, beyond that. Who knows what they messed with? And then summon some crazy, like, you know, fire demon or water. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's yeah, it's definitely. Well, I'm telling you, listen, these spirits in Justin's scary. house, they're messing with the wrong guy, let me tell you. Yeah. I dare you to mess with I'm Justin. Gonna, I'm going to punch him in the face. No, I'm just kidding. Don't, <laughs> don't, challenge, don't challenge the evil spirits. <laughs> hey, speaking of school, so I got a funny story for you, right? So uh, my daughter had a basketball game. So I'm like, I'm at home and I'm trying to rush and I'm going to jam over there. So on the way there, um, I look down. So you guys, okay. So you guys obviously know this. I every once in a while wear like a shirt for this YouTube channel, and I'll get all kinds of weird, funny shirts or whatever. Well, anyway, I had. You guys know the shirt I have? Your lizard people one, or no, your mushroom, no, no. mushroom one. Yeah, there's there's like an alien sitting on like a mushroom yeah, and yeah. Smoking, he's a smoking a joint, a joint and the there's room. another alien like took psychedelics or whatever. Dude, I walk in. I remember my my daughter. Oh she's, my god, she's in sixth grade that? Catholic school, bro. Oh right? So I walk in <laughs> and I have on. This freaking alien drug shirt on my I'm wearing it right now, and I walk in and I'm like, oh, how embarrassing! Oh, whatever, oh dude. dude, it's all right. Dude. No parents say anything. No, but of course you know not, because you're all jacked. You know what? what? <laughs> Inside, they're all talking shit, but no one wants to say anything. Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe. Of course, either that or I, I mean, I, don't I know. had one of those moments because we for a while there, I was like, oh yeah, it's a good idea, so, and like. I, I got one of those like Gavin Newsom shirt with like a clown nose on it, right? And I and I and I didn't realize I was picking my kids up and I was talking to their teacher and everything. <laughs> like I got so many looks. I'm like, why are everybody looking at me all 
<laughs> like funny like that, you know? And I'm like, oh my God, I probably pissed everybody off. Well, that was like our original idea. Our, our very first t-shirt we ever did was zero fucks, which I thought was a brilliant idea until I thought about, oh wow, not a lot of places that I could wear this. Without <laughs> yeah. <pretty> much yeah. <laughs> fucks oh, right across the shirt. Walk around just In theory, it sounded like F-bomb. such a great idea. Then you do it just like, oh, okay, you can't really wear this. Yeah, I'm going to go to church now. See yeah, you guys. Yeah. Well, speaking <laughs> yeah. of zero fucks, I'm glad you give a fuck, Adam, and you decided you're not going to do Brazilian jiu-jitsu anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sold now. On, we have two guys, right, that work for us, right? Both uh, Gio and Eli, yeah. both in the last, what, less than three months, have like injuries like, that require bicep. surgery. Yeah. And I'm like, uh, yeah, the idea of- Torn knee, torn knee bicep. That needs surgery. Yeah, like, yeah dude, I'm cool. And I know, and I know you've cool. been saying you want to jiu-jitsu. I, I'm so happy you're not because- you, you're, I mean, you're a little injury prone. So this, yeah. I'm just so happy you're not doing it. Bro. He's got the long limbs for it, though, right? Like, nope. He's got the yeah. build. Stop. Yeah, Stop. Yeah. I'm just, you know, I'm too competitive. Don't for encourage him, bro. Okay, you're right. You're right. Want, you're right. You're right. I don't want to see Adam end up with an injury. Well, I wanted to because, like, I, I was like, this is a perfect sport to get my kids, like, the next progression from gymnastics because yeah. it's, dude, I love what they're doing and it, it's great and they're they're having a lot of like awesome like progression success with it. But I'm like, can I do something a little more like? Mm, manly? Did yeah. you show? No, no. Hold on a second. That's hella. I just pissed everybody off. So I know you did. I know, but like, I dude, mean, definitely every every guy I, in gymnastics. I, you do, listen, like. like as a spectator, that's all I'm saying. Like, I know as you're doing it with the rings, it's badass, and you know, and like it's flipping hard. and stuff, and it's really hard. Yes, and, but it really sucks for spectators. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, the saying. tournament. Did you show Sal? Did you show Sal your kids? Oh, I didn't show because I showed out of my like. They're, yeah. they're doing moves, bro. Well, I mean, okay, so like if, flipping and kicking as a, and a, as an early form of activity for kids, there's nothing better than gymnastics. nothing better. It's nothing. Fact, that's it's why I'm all for it. I promote yeah. it. That, honestly, he's all just the afraid time. Get, they're gonna get hardcore into it. <laughs> yeah, want, exactly. But, like, yeah. I, like if they keep going and like it's their thing. Yeah, it's Ethan gonna comes. Kinda... Dad, I'm thinking about joining the cheerleading team. Bro, I want to be. A, I want to be a base. <laughs> it's coming. It is what it is. You can't control any of that stuff. I'm just saying. Well, jujitsu for manly sports. Jujitsu. Well, whatever. Like jujitsu is a great so sport sexist. i know yeah. it's such a great sport because uh it teaches you humility and you and you have to check your ego at the door i can't think of a sport better than jujitsu for that because you will get your ass kicked and you will get your ass kicked by smaller well, guys in and you. it's a great way to diffuse a lot of like conflicts and fights like Dude. right away yeah you talk about manly i'll tell you what you want to hear a story a manly story we i had we had an instructor a female instructor who was uh, i don't know 130 pound you know, so average, small size, and she was a purple belt or whatever, which is, a, you know, you're, at, at that point, you're pretty good. And we had a dude come in, average size guy, 190 pound dude or whatever, obviously, he's a man, and he wanted to try the class out. And sometimes when you get beginners that come in and we, they do the sparring, they just go crazy and they go super hard. In fact, if you do jujitsu, anybody who does jujitsu knows you're, you're more likely to get hurt with a beginner than you will with a black belt because they don't know which way to move. They'll jerk too quickly in one direction, and, and it can be a bit dangerous because they don't know how their body awareness isn't great. Well, anyway, he's doing the sparring. He's going against another beginner, and he's a big, strong, dumb idiot, and he's whipping this guy around, and she stops him a couple times, and she says, no, 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 go a little easier. You're going to twist his ankle. You're going to do this, whatever. Anyway, he didn't listen. He ended up hurting the guy. Mm. So she said, listen, next round, you spar against me, and he made this face, like total douchebag face, right? Kind of like, oh, it's, you know, a girl. All right, I'm going to go against you. And the rest of us were like, oh, yeah, <laughs> you're going to get your ass Get kicked. the popcorn out, you guys. Yeah. And she choked him to sleep. Yeah, that's great. She put him to sleep, and he snored. Have you ever seen someone get choked out? They snore? Sometimes they'll snore. That oh, happens? Wow. Yeah, if you get put, choked put out on your back. Ram all of a sudden. Yeah. <laughs> Do this. <laughs> I didn't know that. Oh, dude, he woke up, and his face turned red. He was super embarrassed. And oh, we're like, no. He's like, what happened? Like, she... She choked you out, bro. <laughs> she put your ass to sleep. Yikes. Uh, so, no, it's a, it's a great sport. I think that's it's a, a lot of fun to do. Yeah, you'll have to show them the video, though. The, yeah. the boys yeah. are already getting really good. That's not, it's only been what, one year? Oh, no. They've been a, a couple year. years. Yeah, a few months. Yeah. Oh, it's even been a year? About, no, probably about, I'm going to say six months to be Wow. Fair. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. great. No, so, really. Yeah, they're, they're, they've really taken off with it. And it's, it does help that they're really into the trampoline stuff with that and so yeah trampoline, i can't wait parkour i can't wait it. to put my son in uh, in gymnastics i absolutely can't wait oh, Spe- yeah. oh dude i got a con- i got a conspiracy theory for you jo- not a theory but something that's going to trigger some conspiracy theories Ooh. did you see the video of the massive amounts of birds a huge a, it's like a huge crowd of birds randomly all died and fell on the ground in mexico what did you see this 
Why is it always in Mexico? Like I've seen phenomena like that before, uh, video wise. But like, what, what was it? Like a electromagnetic pulse or something that they're guessing. They're they don't guessing, know. But yeah. there's a video. I don't know if Doug can find it. But literally, the, there's like a video of, and just like a lot of them. Okay, so you ever seen like like when there's a huge amount of a flock of birds and it looks like a dark mass? Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's literally they just fall out of the sky. What? Dead. End of days, dude. It did just, that happen in like a movie? Is there a movie that did that something like that? Well, when mystery they all, is a huge. What was the date? Is this one of the South things? that's like no, four look, years old. Look at this. Watch, watch, watch this. All of a sudden, here we go. Ready? Okay, I saw. So it's like normal day. One bird. Normal day, in Mexico. Okay. Oh, Boom! What? Bunch of dead birds. And they all just died. Fell. That's it. All dead. Wait, wait, wait. They're still flying south. No, yeah. no. Look at the ground. I mean, a whole shit ton of them died. Wow, a hundred of them. Wow. Isn't that crazy? What? That what? is weird. What's going on? Show that again, Doug. Let me see what the. That was weird. Yeah. Did they? I mean, now some of them survived. How, what are some of the theories? Like, did did you read any of them, or they? I don't know, dude. I think uh, you know. Do you imagine if you came out of your house and you just saw that? If you saw a hundred birds just dead on the ground like that on your on your, or they just fell on your house? Wouldn't yeah, you think you were cursed? I probably or put a gas mask on or something. Yeah, dude. dude. Like, be like I paranoid. What's that one conspiracy theory, Justin? Uh, that one like weather changing device, harp, but like DARPA. Is it harp yeah. or is it something like that? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Where they have like this device that they could like like shoot the. Some yeah. part of the atmosphere, and so cause- it's not like they seed because they they can seed clouds. Yes, and um, get them to like. Did you see? And- did you see the theory? What did it say? The theory they said that, that there's a chance that the birds inhaled fumes from like an electrical charge from like one of the the wires or the boxes. Oh, okay. Mm. And and enough of them inhaled it, and then they died from it. I That's cool. Wow. I, I think man. those are two separate things. Yeah. I oh. think they could have either inhaled fumes or there was an overcharged electrical. Oh, uh, oh, uh, oh. Uh, uh. well, yeah. Those are the same thing. There's <laughs> weird stuff, man, that happens in the world. You, you, <laughs> yeah. guys, ever, you guys ever see those um, electrical orbs? There's, that's an yeah. like actual weather phenomenon. I've seen that. Yeah. Where it's like, a, rather than lightning, it forms a ball that'll fly through you the air. You see them sometimes like uh, rolling across roads. Like I've seen videos of that. And you're like, oh, yeah, sure. it must be some kind of camera trick. Or But no, Dude, it's, we're you, definitely watching different you stuff. You need to for inform sure. yourself. <laughs> yeah, bro. I was, but you know what I was doing actually the other night was watching the uh, the NBA game. I actually didn't get, the, it wasn't a Warrior game because they don't do uh, every game. It's just randomly. The, I finally got to do the VR. Yeah, the, was it uh, worth it? Yeah, it's very cool, dude. It's super cool. So, so where were you sitting? Uh, so the way it works is the the part that I can't figure out how they do this is so when I when I went into this game, it was the the Nuggets versus I don't remember. It doesn't matter. Uh, but anyway, it was the Nuggets playing somebody. Is that a real name of a team? Yeah, the Denver Nuggets. Yeah, the Nuggets wow. Man. Yeah. I don't know. Um, about that. Anyways, <laughs> there's like there was like a 900 people that were there. That we're viewing it virtually, right? At, at the same time, I didn't have to pay, by the way, too. It's free, so you have you, Do you see the other the other VR. People? Oh yeah, no, I, I can see their avatar. So when I walk in, you see my avatar with my name above it. So I met my buddy there. What's your avatar look like? Um, you know, he's got a bunch of gray hair. I just did a quick one, real quick. I really, just, like, you didn't make it cool? No, I haven't spent I haven't spent enough time to like make my avatar like really look like me. So you know, so if someone sees it, you're not going to recognize it. it can look. you make it an animal? I think so. Yeah, that'd be cool if you're like a horse. Adam yeah. would have like Gucci sunglasses. So I think I think you I think you could make yeah, I think you could do that. Anyways, you uh you know, you see the the, the handle of the person and they don't have you no know, the avatars don't have legs, they're like floating, right? So but you see their upper from like waist up oh, okay. and everything and then with their with their name. But what's cool about it is that one, we all fit it. the The game is either uh, a um, a sideline view. So when the tip off happened, it was a sideline view, court side. So I feel literally feel like, and it's about as clear as what, um, you know, high def TV was about ten years ago. No, that's not bad at all. No, not at all. It's great. It's, so it's not quite like four K feeling yeah. yet, but I mean, mm-hmm. I, I can't imagine where it's going to be in just a couple of years. But I'm you're you're watching the game right here. My buddy is right here, and we you know we look at each other and talk and stuff like that, and then go back to look at the game. You're watching, and then when it when the when the when the ball gets tipped off and it moves to one side of the court, it gives you a baseline uh, view, so you're underneath the hoop. So now when when the when the ball goes over to this side of the court, it automatically the, it gives you the switches the camera angle. And now I'm on court side, and the and the game is coming towards me. And then when it goes the other direction, same thing. It flips to the other side. So you're basically rotating from three different. Court views. Now, if you're okay, huh. let's say the NBA championships on. 
it's the Warriors, your favorite team. Yeah. Are you watching in VR or are you watching on TV? Oh, that's an interesting question. I yeah, I'd probably watch it on TV still. So it's still not to the point. If yet. it was as clear, hundred percent I'd watch it like okay. that. Just because it's not quite like on my TV, it's gonna be but they have their own announcers. So they have specific announcers for VR. So they are talking to all the people in that community. That you weird. can hear weird. so I'm at, I'm on the I'm on the courtside seats and all these other people that are in, you know, the VR world, I can hear them having conversations. And I can either, if I want to, I can mute them out and mute myself and I can go into a private chat. So what my buddy and I did was we linked to each other privately so we could have a private conversation so people can't hear, or you can open it publicly so you can all interact and mingle and, and, and talk with each other. But it's just like I told you on that one game where if it's, if people are conversing, like say, you know, 10, 15 yards from me, it's like mumbles, but not clear as I walk up on them. You can hear it yeah, very clear. So wow, that's weird. Yeah, it's so trippy because you'll be sitting there watching a game, and then all of a sudden you hear somebody, and you can't help. You're watching. You know, I'm like courtside watching a game, and then I can hear a conversation, and you, you, know, you turn around to look, and then there's now, someone standing there trying to talk to doing you. Doing something like this, could you, could you see that in in the near future, people are going to go to parties and stuff like that? And for sure. Like, yeah, because it's cool for that. It really is. So here's the thing. Like, I mean, it would never replace uh, an in person party. But I mean, here's here's my buddy. My buddy lives uh, about two hours from where I live. I get to see him maybe once a month or whatever. We're both diehard Warrior fans. The fact that we can organize, hey, Thursday night Warriors play at seven, and they're on VR. I'll meet you in there. It's kind of well, fucking it's cool. The same as like uh, what they figured out with with uh, video games. When you get the headsets and you can talk to your friends, yeah. you know that was the evolution of that. So it just seems like a natural I, progression. I read this article that said that the. The VR tech is going to be within five years that it'll be indistinguishable from real life. That's, that's where this. Be. So well, that's, that's where this really is going to get crazy because if it gets to a place, it's already as good as what like you know high def TV was ten years ago. Not mm -hmm. quite up to four K, but just, when it gets up to like as good as what my TV is now, or indistinguishable from reality, to where it literally makes me feel like. I feel like I'm on the court. Do you think they're yeah. going to make movies? Well, where you have where you where you put on VR glasses, so you're watching a movie, so you are, oh, but I'm you're sure in the, the fucking movie. I'm it, sure there'll, there'll be a lot of directors out there like coming up with those. What I was thinking was back in the sports side of it was it. This might not work well with basketball, but like for football, if you have it in the helmet and so you you follow your favorite player and you actually have that. Do you right? remember when I predicted that? Yeah, like six years ago when we mm. first started the podcast and we first were speculating on VR way back when. Right? That would be the coolest. I thought that the the future of it would be like this. Like we the 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 Rams just played right, and you would play somebody. You would play like a Stafford as the quarterback, and then I would be a linebacker on the other team. Yeah, and so you're you know you're from his perspective, like <laughs> looking like the quarterback <laughs> yeah. who's getting ready to hike it, and I'm the linebacker who's watching to see where you're going. Like you get to see their perspective. I totally think that's coming, yeah. and I don't see that'd be crazy. And I I think they'll be able to charge big money to do it. I think it'll be an incredible experience for the user. So it's really interesting what it's going to look like i know all of this is like a speculating on pro probably in 2000 speculating on what the dot com was going to yeah. look like you know so probably a lot of the shit we're saying isn't going to look anything like what we're saying have you ever seen that movie sal the one that was like in first person shooter perspective the whole movie oh was shot like i that. saw some of that yeah i did that was an interesting that movie. was yeah i was wondering how well that did because i would see like something like that for like a vr movie might work that format i know i i would yeah i think vr like i could imagine putting on vr watching a movie and being like a passive uh, you know person in the movie so it's mm. like you're you're in the haunted house or you're in the fucking murder so there was the, a you're just walking through the movie oh, so there's a yeah. so my my son's hardcore into dinosaurs right now and so i was on his ipad i love dinosaurs and i pulled up this it's called jurassic jurassic creations it's like a jurassic park spinoff and it's this little kid it's a cartoon and the little kid and I didn't know what this was, but it's first person. You're in the you're in this game. It's actually a kid. The, the cartoon is a kid in is playing VR. He's playing the video game, but you are watching it through his avatar's perspective in the video game. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So like he's like running through the field, and and then he hears the the roar of the dinosaur, and he flips and looks the other way, and the the whole thing is whipping around. You're following it as if you're the the avatar. So there's already stuff. Huh. That's kind of like that's that. That's going to be weird. Yeah. It is going to be wild. Yeah. It's going to be uh I don't know like the I'm I think it's really intriguing like this whole thing with my buddy. I, never once would I ever consider staying home watching it on VR than going with my buddy the game, but the reality is 
I would never be able to watch, you know. But you're a, also a different generation. I think kids growing up with that kind of stuff may I'll, prefer it. They probably would. You might be right. I mean, especially, I mean, you it, obviously the price, right? You know, you're not sitting courtside spending under two thousand to four thousand mm. dollars minimum. You know, so you know the fact that I can go to that venue for free. That's uh, that in itself. I think is really. I think I think that is just a. That's so cool, and that we can give access to people that may would never be able to do that. Now they have access to that. Yeah, I know they still have the expensive goggles, blah, 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 and we're not quite there yet. But, yeah, but that, if we're already, know, tech, tech gets cheaper and cheaper. That's right. We're, if we're right here now where the most expensive part is the VR goggles for 400 bucks, I mean, it's going to probably be... I could see shopping like that, right? Yeah. You put on your VR... Like right now we go shopping on Amazon on your phone. But imagine you put on your VR goggles and you're in the department store looking at the clothes that you want to buy. So well, I'll take that. Or you're at yeah, the grocery store that, and yeah. you're picking what you want. You're putting it in the cart and then the guy. This is why the you. like you know shops like Nike and stuff like that have already bought in the metaverse. Mm -hmm. That's their their they believe is going to happen. Is you're going to be able to go imagine meeting your buddy. Oh, I'll meet you at the Nike store. You know they got the new the new Jordans just dropped and this just yeah. dropped. Let's go and check can, them like, out. Pick them up and look yeah. at them, rotate them. No, totally. I think that's I think you're you're spot on. I think it's going to go that way i just saw it too the other day did you see that i forgot the name of that nft just 20 23 million dollars it sold for oh my gosh the jpeg what? oh yeah. god look at look, look for uh look up uh nft sells for 23 million I mean, it wasn't like a board uh board ape i always say that wrong see i think some i think like the board apes are going to be worth money just because we all talk about them but a lot of these are going to crash man unless there's actual Something of value tied to them. Yeah, but even those, remember, so the the best argument I've heard about stuff like the Bored Ape is like, man, you got, you know, Steph Curry, and there's a whole list of celebrities that own these things now, right? Yeah. Jimmy Fallon's, like, you know, right? Yeah. They all, all these celebrities own it. And so the idea is like, wow, here I can be a, a normal person that if I could afford it, I can now interact with this. But what happens when they all get bored of doing it? Well, look at this, a yeah. Crypto Punks Alien Avatar That's NFT. It. But what does it do? It's just an avatar. Oh, I don't get it. I feel like an I feel like an old fuddy duddy. Yeah, there's, I'm sure there's all kinds of things they attach to it, or some kind of incentive. Yeah, I mean, right? there's there's experiences. There's going to be the interaction, the club thing. I think where where people are getting where it's overhyped is just, and I th I think it was you, Sal, who brought it up first. Was just, I mean, if you had to bank, I would be curious to see this. If Doug could look this up, what what businesses, what dot com businesses are around today that were that were there for day one? Yeah, mm -hmm. are there any? Um, uh, eBay was one of the first ones, right? Was it? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. I, I know eBay's been around for a little while. Amazon, right? Amazon started a mm -hmm. long time ago. I mean, the big ones, but most of them just uh, nothing. Yeah. Right? So I mean, I, I think it's gonna be like that, where you know, huge, huge. Watch it's out. going. It, yeah, it's going to completely change how we do things. It's here to stay. It's gonna be amazing. Mm -hmm. All this cool stuff, but. What is going to be here ten years from now? I think we're crazy to think that we know what that is, and you know, sure, this stuff that has a lot of hype, like the board ape and, and this stuff, like the, the what is it, the crypto punk or what it was called, sounds really cool right now. But I mean, what if it's not cool in five years? Yeah. You know, <laughs> that's exactly it. Yeah. So anyway, how are you feeling? Double uh, dosing your pure. That's you your. That's your. That's the extent of your experimentation. You doubled up. Uh, yeah, yeah it's the first. No, it's, a, it's a, No, it's the first time that I literally. Ju I just finished it right now, so um, it feels like it's starting to set in a little bit. I really like even doing like a double dose of that. It doesn't make me feel uh, like caffeine racy. No. Um, I just feel alert. I yeah. feel really alert from it, and I don't know cerebral. I don't know if that's the right word to use for that, but I fear. I feel clear. Yeah. yeah. They they knocked it out of the park with that with that product. And uh, I'm excited for them to come out with some of the new stuff. I've tasted some of the new I stuff. I would like really to. I would. I mean, yeah, I, I got to taste that still. It would be neat to see them out. play with some flavors with that. Because we like it, we use it so much, I get kind of bored of the same flavor all the time. I know it's a very basic, neutral flavor. You mm -hmm. know me, I'm all flavor. You're like, you'll eat whatever. But I, it'd be nice. To, <laughs> yeah. <it's laughs> cool. Yeah. yeah. When, when it comes to supplements, it has to taste like candy. Otherwise, Adam doesn't <laughs> No, like it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to taste. But I just get, I get bored of the same Bubble flavors flavor. all the time. You know, speaking of that, didn't our other partner, didn't yeah. they just come up with a new flavor for my favorite thing that I take every night? The, oh, you're talking yeah, about Mellow. Uh, Mellow it, from Ned? It's like a lemon. Well, I forget. Meyer what? lemon? Meyer lemon. Because right now, all they have is the naked and they have the uh, Na um, naked lavender. Naked's just lavender. like a plain taste, I love right? naked. Yeah, of course you do. Um, and uh, no, I'm <laughs> I'm really off. into the the lavender one, berry. Yeah, uh, so it was really good. But it'd be a nice change of pace, you know, have a different flavor. So is it official? Night. Did they drop that already? 
I think it's out. It's on their website. Why don't we have it? I, I always get so mad at our partners when this happens. <laughs> it's like we, we're like we're like one of the best partners for all of our partners, and yeah. a lot of times they drop something, and it's like you why, know what I use they like, like we we not harder. You know what I've been using like crazy is their obviously I love their hemp oil, but the capsules of the hemp oil, I love it. Yeah, you so easy to take. I took it when we got sent the free samples, and I have not gone back to it and used it. I haven't messed with it. I really I use them all the time. Do you like it better than than the dropper now? Or it's the using, same formula. It's just in it's capsule. just in capsules. You don't have to put the the dropper. hemp oil in your mouth. So you don't have to look like a, like a, a druggie yeah. in the middle of like. No, Courtney prefers that. Yeah, she doesn't like the taste as much. I I like the taste of, of hemp oil. Do you really? Yeah, it's not flavored. It's just hemp. It tastes like kind of like weed. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, let's be honest here, you guys. It does. Yeah. It does. It's got that kind of. Well, you aftertaste. also like edibles. Like you definitely yeah. gravitate towards the edibles all the time. Oh, there it is. Yeah. See. So it what is junky. it? It's, it's what's the flavor? Meyer down? lemon. What lemon? What'd Meyer. You say? Me, what's Meyer? What's that mean? The Meyer lemons. Are you familiar? They're kind uh, of very juicy. Not. Yeah. I mean, they almost seem mm. like a hybrid between. Aren't they the ones that you like lemonade or is made with typically? I mean, you no? can. I can make lemonade with them uh, so, or the so traditional. What, what's the history of Meyer? Is that a location? Or uh, maybe no the person who so basically like, bred them. I don't know. Well, I so, wonder because I have a plethora of lemons. You see all that bag I brought. Did you, any of you guys take any listen, of those? Listen, I did. I have so I, many of them. I, I can't because if I get a lemon from anywhere else than my dad's house uh, and he finds out, it's he, big trouble. Yeah, did I you don't. guys do lemon and sugar when you were kids? Is that like, bad? Like uh, eat a lemon? So I used to cut a lemon in half and you put a pile of sugar <laughs> on a plate and you'd spin it, lick it off, spin it, lick it wow. off. Wow. You, didn't do that oh, you have like certain hacks like that. And there was one with like a, what was it, cream cheese? You call it like the yeah, white yeah. trash yeah. snack yeah. or something? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Yeah. 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 Pork, yeah. pork candy? Yeah, my white trash sandwich. <laughs> <that was amazing. laughs> no, yeah, it's yeah. bread. So you get bread sticks. I know he's talking about these, but bread sticks and then the Philadelphia oh, cream cheese and then you wrap salami over it. Yeah. If you've never had that, that's amazing. Wait a minute. Bread stick? You get like a cream cheese. The thick bread sticks yeah. right the like the big ones yeah, yeah, yeah you lather it up with cream cheese yeah. all up and down it and then you wrap salami around it and then you eat it. it's amazing oh wow yeah. that's, it's that's so hilarious. funny like i we mine, mine are sometimes. so bad i don't no, even recommend yeah. no you did it i'm sorry i'm laughing <laughs> Dang, and, the, was and the dessert was like lemons and oh, sugar bro no. <laughs> <laughs> shut your mouth no way we had yeah. horses though you I did. Gotta, gotta, you had, hey, you bro, had, I had some poor uh, delicacies that I enjoyed growing up, too. I was like all about the, the nacho cheese Doritos with cheese on top to make nachos. Oh, my God. It was it was like a cheese well, explosion. All, jo all joking aside, I mean, I my, obviously four kids in my family, immigrant parents. So for us, like splurging was like, did mom buy the, the name brand cereal? Oh, sh mm. the one in the box? Because she would get the one in the bag. Remember that? Oh yeah, yeah, where you could get the one of the box yeah, that had the name that like rhymed with like the real name. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't like it wasn't uh, Lucky Charms. It was yeah. Marshmallow Mateys or something like yeah. that, right? <laughs> and it came in a big ass bag, yeah. you know. And I'd be all embarrassed when my friends would come over. I go pour. <laughs> you know what I would do? I'd get their bowl and pour it in the closet. So I'd throw a milk on it. Here Wait, you this go. This is weird. Is this what Captain Crunch? Yeah. Yeah. Like, no. This Where's is the, the blue Admiral moon Snap? At? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is, uh, okay. <laughs> Lieutenant, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Crunchy. <laughs> That's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. No, you know what we used to be? I was Actually, it's funny. I was talking to uh, my wife about this because we, we eat out sometimes. And when we eat out, I like to eat out and enjoy the food and have a nice meal or whatever. And she's like, did you guys eat out when you guys were kids? I said, you know what was a, like a big deal? Fast food. McDonald's. Yeah, that was a big deal for us. Too. When it was a big deal, it was like, hey, kids, we're going to. We're gonna go to McDonald's tonight. Ah, you know, we get all excited. Uh huh. Yeah. And that was like a big deal. Uh, but no, no, you know, now I, you know like, to be. I don't even. I can't recall. It's so bad, right? I don't. I don't know if I ever remember sitting in a restaurant and eating a, any restaurant uh, dinner with my family. Mm. Not as a kid, at least. Yeah, as an adult, as kid, we have me some of that. I mean, unless you count like Golden Corral and like uh, fucking what's the other? What's Golden Corral? It's like, it, it's like one of those or something. Yeah, yeah, or like a buffet, like Percos. We oh, had I that. love buffets. Yeah, yeah. Sun Sundays after church, I think we had Percos plenty, plenty of times or whatever. But yeah. we go to like yeah. Carl's Jr. Yeah, I don't have a memory of like a steakhouse. Like my family, like us going to like a steakhouse dinner, all of us together. And if we did, I apologize, mom. You know, you see this, and we did that, and I didn't realize it. Sizzler. But. That's what we did once. Scissor was actually my twice. favorite steakhouse Scissor. as a kid. Yeah. Yeah. But at that point, I think it was probably one of the best steaks I had. They had a teriyaki steak I absolutely loved growing up. The Sizzler. Did, they still exist? did you see did you see uh, Doug just pulled up the Meyer thing? What is it? So he was right. It's named after somebody. It is a cross between a lemon and an orange. 
but it's named after a dude, Meyer, from yeah, Beijing. Yeah, Frank China. Meyer, and he brought it from China. Wow. Same guy. Oscar Meyer, right? Same guy, right? Oscar no, Meyer's no, brother. Oscar Meyer Lemons. No. <laughs> I'm joking. So what's uh, this this baby fart? Uh, oh, uh, dude. I, I need to hear about this. I got to tell you. So yeah. my son, you know I, you know, you're raising him right when they do shit like this, right? So <laughs> we're playing, and I'm playing on with my son, and he, you know, we, we have a good time. He likes to laugh, and he's a very, uh, he's a very affectionate happy easy to laugh kid so it's fun to hang out with this little guy anyway i'm chasing him around the house and he's running and he does this little baby language blah 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 blah, and we're having fun and then i go and i sit down after he's because he's found something he was playing with and then he runs over to me so i'm like oh what's going on buddy and he runs he looks at me with a smile and he just pauses for a little bit. I'm like, what's up, buddy? And then he just farts. <laughs> He's just squeezing it out. And then he starts laughing. Ha, 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 ha. I'm like, oh, <laughs> he already knows. Yeah, dude. Oh, and then he runs away. I was like, oh, this is great. Yeah, you got to keep us pulled. Right now, I know this is like, right? Once you get past that one year, I really feel like the, the milestones, the new stuff, like... Doesn't it happen almost every week or every other week? Yeah. You feel like he he does something different that you catch his catch yeah, you by surprise. Yeah, I taught him to like to to spank his mom's butt, which might be a bad thing because now oh, he's doing God. it all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she was on the mm-hmm. couch and he's mm-hmm. like hitting her butt because <laughs> I laugh, right? So he thinks it's funny, and I'm like, oh man, I shouldn't show him to do that to his mom. He'll do it some to yeah, my mom or something. Walk around, pull the finger, yeah, yes. so he can do the, it on command. This is good stuff, but we, there's good stuff we teach him too. Like I said, he's very affectionate, very loving, hugs and kisses everybody. Makes me super happy. We just transitioned him into his like full size bed now. Like he has a full size bed. Oh, that, that's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. So it's cool to. You know what? I would have never thought we could do, and it one hundred percent works. I don't know. You're probably not quite there yet because you're still in the crib right now, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, but you have the same Nanit camera as I do, right? Uh, no, I think we have a we have a cheap one. Oh, you don't have the Nanit? We don't have the one with the app on the phone like you guys do. Oh yeah, you need to upgrade, dude. Yeah. So. I didn't think this would work, but you know we can actually talk to him. Like I knew we had that feature, but I'm like, oh, it's probably gonna scare him, or he's gonna who cares if he wants up, he's gonna cry, he's gonna get up yeah. no matter what. But he listens, like, and I'm watching him on the camera. So like now the routine. Oh yeah, we talk to Aurelius all the time. Now the routine is I put him when I put him down in the bed. I can see like obviously as soon as it moves, it sen- it sends an yeah. alert to me right away, right? So sometimes he'll wake up and he'll go to climb off his bed, and before he his foot hits the ground, Maximus, get back in bed. And he'll go right back in dude, bed. What, you he know went, what? I was scared the shit out of that, him. Right. That's what I thought, too. I was like, this will never work. But it's well, like, see, these kids, like, oh, shit. He now, listens okay, right away. Do you away. think this? Because I think this. Because I think it's great. It's convenient. It works. We do that with our son. But do you kind of think, because I think this a little bit, these kids are so used to being under surveillance. Like, is it good for them to all, to be so used to it and comfortable with it? Oh, someone's watching me. Dad's watching, you know, mom's watching me, like someone's watching. I mean, I think, uh, I think if you carry that on to where, where they're actually going to have, like, do you remember anything before five? I don't. Before five years old? So I don't, so I don't. You, oh, okay. So I see what you're saying. So yeah. So once so, he has a certain age, take it Yeah. Out. Yeah. I'm not going to have cameras in there when he's like 12. <laughs> no, no, you know no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So. Stop it, son. So Stop I think, it, son. <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, I would totally. Clean that up. I would totally agree with you if if you maintain that, and I maybe you know this will be interesting, right? Because I know that it'll be his mom that will be the last one to break from that. Because I'm always like, you know, why, we don't need any of that, or I'm like, stop looking at it. Like you'll know, you'll hear him if he, he's trying to get up or whatever. Like, so she's more attached to using the camera than I am for sure already. So if it's anyone that'll keep it around longer, it'll be her. But I imagine that. Once he gets, we were just talking about like, you know, him, she was asking me last night, she goes, you know, do you think, what age do you think we're going to be able to just leave the door open and, you know, he'll, he'll just stay in bed when he knows he'd be in bed. We don't actually close the door and keep him in there. And I was like, I don't know, a couple, I don't know, another year or so maybe then when he'll be able to do that. So, um, yeah, I think if you were, if you had cameras on your kid, like past five, I think maybe that would be a problem, but he's not going to remember. <laughs> now, did you get him like a normal bed or is like a race car? So his, his, his crib, uh, transforms into like a. So the 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 like a transformer. Yeah. yeah. Well, it turns into a full size bed. So, oh yeah 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 convertible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. So <laughs> it, that it's now it. that's the headboard, and then all we had to do is get the 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 mattress for it, and so yeah, he's got a full size. That's then, so cute. Yeah, she took him. It was she she did take him to um, pick out his his sheets and everything. And she's like, I had no idea what he would. I couldn't believe what he picked. She goes, I thought for sure it was gonna be dinosaurs, or I thought like his whole his things that he's into. 
Uh, he's going through a, a Mario Kart phase though now. So ever since he got the Mario Kart racetrack, oh wow, which is super cool by the way. I wish racetracks were like that when we were kids. Oh, yeah. Like that thing is like. Did you guys see that? I've posted it a couple times. Like now, I you know which one I got, and I wanted it so bad. I wanted it forever. So those old Hot Wheel ones, but even better. No, not Hot Wheel. They actually had uh, they were electric, and you'd push the button. Oh like a yeah, car, yeah, yeah. And they squeeze it like a gun, and yeah, then they zip. They never lasted though. They, they never would, did. They never lasted. They always flew off, and then yeah. eventually broke and everything. Yeah. Man, they didn't break. Yeah, you know what's happening right now that you know I'm I'm trying to be like zen about it, you know, and not. But I and I said this from the very beginning. Like my thing is like manufacturing adversity, and yeah. I don't want. I'm, I'm my concern is that my son is going to grow up in a very different life than I did, and you know, there's some good things to that, and there's some. I think some things to be concerned about. Like I don't want him. Like he's to, not going to eat breadsticks with uh, <laughs> cream cheese and salami for dinner. <laughs> oh, he'll bring. He's already back, been to it. Right? He's already ate at a nice restaurant already. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, no. So I think about that stuff a lot, and um, you know, I really wanted the family to get behind the whole like stock thing for him, like that was the stockpile, and yep. get them to like, hey, if, you know, instead of buying him toys. You know, I would really, even if it's five dollars, ten dollars, you know, throw it in his stock account instead for his future, instead of just getting this kid stuff because he's got everything he could possibly need and want already. But boy, is that not working? And it's like it, it feels like, and right now he's going through a phase since so since Christmas. It's too logical, Adam. Yeah, I don't know. It's because it's he, not for him. The gifts are for them. It is, and and he is now he understands presents. And I told you the the thing I did with my what happened with my mother in law, like but leading up to Christmas, like giving him a present every day to yeah. un unwrap. So everybody loves to watch him open a present because he gets so excited yeah. so the damn kids getting fucking toys still right now like every other day like someone <laughs> i come home and i'm like we have fucking three racetracks right now what? my whole dining room now every corner and they're not like little tiny little cheap trait racetracks they're like those mario kart ones wow. i got th like everybody has to like give him something and i'm like and then, I, and then I also don't want to be that dad who's like being an asshole about it being like stop giving my kid stuff it's <laughs> <Yeah>. like <laughs> But at the same time, too, like I don't want my kid Bro, to have have everything. No, dude. you know what yeah. happens is they have so much stuff that they they only play with one thing, and it's like yeah. a waste. They don't play with other stuff too. Well, so. that, see now, yeah. Katrina tries to argue with me on that too. She's, he plays with everything, yeah. you know. So he, just ask him for a receipt. Hey, give me the receipt with the toy, just in case any return. I return that shit. No, yeah. We would just take it and, and then donate it or give it to the. It's neighbors. an interesting situation that I'm in right now. Because I know what you mean because I'm I'm wrestling with like I also don't want to be a dick about it, right? Yeah. Like it's like. And and I, I understand all the grandparents and the, the sister in laws yeah. and brother like they all want to experience that a little bit too. So I'm trying to be like flex school about it, but then at the same time I'm watching like yeah. my kid. My kid has more toys already at two and a half years old than I'm pretty sure I had my entire life <laughs> growing up yeah. already. It's like we're just yeah. getting started. Well, you know what? I, oh, I no, it's, luck, it's bizarre. Luckily, I have cousins and brothers who just had kids, so I give their kids stockpile, and so they're doing the same thing back. Luckily. So that I at least to get that. I got very. I lit. My sister did it. I love you. Okay. My sister was one of the only people that did it. She did still buy a toy, but she's like, I still want to buy a toy, but I did do a stockpile. Mm -hmm. and so I'm like, all right, that's cool. Like nobody else bought into it. I'm like so upset. I'm like, dude. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is one of those things. They want to see the reaction and they want to see them engage with, you know, so it's, it is kind of one of those hard things to, to get them buy in on the idea that like, hey, like watch what this does later on. And then they're going to look back and be like, oh, thanks, aunt, you yeah. know, for this. Or, um, you, or you can make them feel bad and be like, hey, instead of just getting him a gift, why don't you spend some time with him? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, I, I feel like I'm, I'm wrestling with them with that, and then I'm wrestling with Katrina, who's she's so reluctant to throw something away or give it away, uh, donate it or whatever, because she tries to make that case. He still plays with it. I'm like, well, yeah, if you have all the toys out for him to play with, like he will move. He owns the house. Yeah, from I toy know. to toy like that. So, I, I mean, I'm looking forward. I think real soon here, Katrina's taking off for a couple of days, and I'm going to be home, and they're going to come back, and there's going to be like two toys left. <laughs> <laughs> two main ones. Yeah, yeah like a couple of the main ones. The rest of them are going for sure, dude. <laughs> dude, going to be donating them. You know, one of the problems with taking supplements uh, that have nutrients that are good for you, like B-complex or vitamin C or glutathione, for example, is the delivery method. You take it, it gets destroyed in your gut, or you pee it out. Nothing gets absorbed. Well, Live On Labs is different. They use a pharmaceutical type liposomal delivery process that takes the nutrients and delivers them where they're supposed to go. And right now, they're running a promotion. If you get their B-complex and their vitamin C, they will send you a free box 
of their liposomal glutathione, which is actually one of my favorite products. I love it. I take it every single day. Go check them out. Head over to liveonlabs.com forward slash MP for that promotion. All right, here comes the rest of the show. Our first caller is Alex from North Carolina. What's up, Alex? How can we help you? Hey, guys. Hope everything's going well. Thanks for having me on and doing this podcast. It's been a great source of information. So one of the questions I wrote is, I've been lifting five times a week on kind of a pull push leg split. Uh, my main goal is to lose body fat. Macros are currently at 200 grams of protein and carbs and 40 to 50 grams of fat. How should I be differentiating kind of how I should be eating on my rest days and training days? Oh yeah. This question comes up a lot. Like, you know, with my calories and macros, do I eat more <clears throat> or less on training days? Okay. So, um, I'm going to talk generally and then I'll get a little specific. Okay, Alex. Okay. Generally speaking, it doesn't really make a difference. Um, you really want to look at it more from a like a week perspective than just the day itself. So it's not going to make a huge difference if the calories are a little lower or higher on a training or a rest day from that perspective. Now, to be more specific, if you really want to start to kind of like, you know, split hairs, um, and this can be different from person to person, but generally speaking, people tend to have better performance. This is based on studies when they eat a little bit more on the days that they train, when they eat more, uh, especially the two, you know, two hours before <clears throat> their workout with a carbohydrate, protein-rich uh, meal. Now, I say that generally speaking because, uh, you know, or, or should I say not for everybody, because for me, I actually do a little better when I eat a little less on my training days, a little more on my rest days. I just feel better that way. And so I listen to my body in that particular case. But again, for most people you're probably going to do better eating more on the days that you train and a little less on the the, tra the days that you don't train from a performance standpoint. And the, well, the research supports that it's more beneficial to undulate, right? So not yeah. having the exact same thing. But what trumps all the advice we're giving right now is whatever you're going to do consistently. Yeah, what works best for you, basically. So, it, you know, the, the one thing that I'm always careful about with giving advice around something like this, if I say, oh, you know, because I'm actually the opposite of Sal. I prefer higher calorie days on days I lift, and then I try and uh, restrict calories on my days off just because it, it works better for my lifestyle. Um, so I, but I hate to put that on somebody else not knowing what they're going to be most consistent with. So I think probably the best answer is to, to kind of play with all of those, right? Maybe do higher calorie on lifting one time and then try lower calorie, then try being, you know, kind of consistent across the board. And there's an argument for it, it, all of those ways. But the, the, I think the best answer is whichever one is uh, most conducive for your lifestyle, whichever one you're going to be better mm -hmm. at staying consistent with, I think that's the, the right answer. Yeah. And Alex, to give you an example, like, um, you know, I would rather. The reason why I, I a couple of reasons why I tend to eat a little less on training days is because I'm busier training and I'm just busier in general. And I do like to save the calories for when I'm not training and I'm more likely to be eating out or hanging out with family. So don't just base your decision off of performance. Also base it, base it off your lifestyle, your behaviors, how you feel. Um, and we make the argument all the time that your behaviors is probably the most important thing to look at because even if you notice a percent difference in performance. It's the behaviors that ultimately drive long-term success or failure. That's the most important thing to look at whenever you're considering you know, what to do, especially in a situation like well, this. Well, for that exact point, that's the reason why I'm the opposite. I know that I'm more likely, if I allow myself more calories on my off days, um, I'm, I'm, um, I, t I make worse choices. Yeah. So, yeah. and I, I just seem to be, so I allow myself, I say, okay, if I'm going to eat more calories, I'm going to do it on training days. Because because I've lifted during the week and I'm, I have a routine, I just tend to be stricter on my diet. Yeah, two and so, different people, two different approaches. Right, right. <laughs> we, we, they're both good. There's really no one, no one better than the other. So does uh, so if your protein consumption is different, you know, say it's a little bit less on your training days, that that won't hinder you know muscle recovery or anything like that. No, no, not really. No, not if it balances out. Not really. I mean, yeah. if it's like zero, yeah. maybe. <laughs> yeah. But no, it's not. I mean, two hundred grams. How much do you weigh? Uh, 235. Yeah, you're fine. 200 grams a day, you're good. You can go to 150. You can go up as high as 220, 230. Um, that rate, and I, I like it. I feel better that way. To be honest with you, I feel better with higher and lower protein days rather than the same all the time. And and you know, I know people will bring up studies showing that oh, there might be higher protein synthesis if it's consistent. Whatever. 
I I don't buy it. I feel better doing it that way from a digestive uh, standpoint. Uh, energy feels better. Gives me a little bit of variety in my diet. You know, I, if, on my lower protein days, well, I got more room for carbs and fats. Um, as long as I don't go too low, right? But you're at, at 200 grams a day at your body weight. I think you're you're totally fine. Cool. Um, one of the other questions I asked was, so right now on my compound lifts, I'm doing a rep scheme of three sets of eight, six, and four with a three minute rest. And then on my accessory lifts, I'm doing more, I guess you could say more hypertrophy focus where it's like three sets of 12, 10, and eight with a one minute rest. And my thought is with those compound lifts, I'm under tension for a longer time. My CNS is under more exertion, but I guess I've just been wondering the past, you know, month or two, I mean, am I working against myself, you know, just in my overall goals, if I'm, if I'm doing different rep schemes, what would you guys suggest and how do you differentiate your rep schemes for each exercise? No, I I think Mm. you're, you're totally fine. I think it's a good idea to go through all kinds of different rep ranges. Now, some exercises, tend to lend themselves better to lower reps and others tend to like, like I'm not going to do laterals uh, for four reps typically because it's harder for me to control the technique and form and not turn it into a, you know, a clean shrug. or yeah, a shrug. Yeah. Right. So some exercises are better low reps and others are better high reps, but generally speaking, all the rep ranges between one to 25 will all build muscle they're all beneficial, and your body tends to get used to a rep range if you stay in it too long. Um, now, we, if you ever look at our MAPS programs, we tend to put people in three to four week phases of a particular mm-hmm. rep range and then move them into another one. Um, and we prefer it that way because it allows you to really get in the groove of a rep range and, and the mentality and the, and the focus and how it feels. As long as you get good at it first. Plus, then you can have uh, you know tangible metrics to kind of look back and see the progression of that. And if it's been effective for you, and if you've, you've you know been able to kind of get move forward strength wise in that rep range, and then switch it up too, so it's you know you can be a little bit more um, objective with what you're doing. That's the biggest point that I would add is what Justin just said is the the one thing that you got to be careful of of because I think what you're doing is great, um, but if you've been doing that for three months consistently, um, it's probably time to switch some things up, right? So that's yeah. kind of the difference between probably how we program in comparison to a lot of stuff I yep. see out there. Is that we, you know, we have these training blocks that are only three to four weeks long, and then we move you into another phase. So we want you to stay in, a, a, you know, a similar way of training like you're doing right now for a period enough, for a long enough period of time to where the body adapts, you build some muscle, you build some strength, but then to move you out quick enough that you don't get stuck in there and you hit a plateau. So exactly. If you've been doing the, the, if you've been following this routine exactly the way you just uh, listed it. For longer than four or five weeks, uh, that would be my one recommendation: is to move out of that. Um, and I mean, I would love to send you a program. So, I don't, have you looked at any of our programs? I've looked at it. I just I haven't bought any of them. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, you been, looks at you. How, how long have you been working out for? Uh, really, about a year consistently. Oh, okay. You know, I weight lifted. You know, probably you know in high school football and all that. But uh, really, this twenty twenty one was my first year. of you know, consistently going, really not missing hardly any days. And okay. All that. And you said fat loss is your goal? Yeah. All right. Let's do it. I'll send you MAPS aesthetic, Alex. Okay. Thank all you. Right. No problem. Thank you. Um, if we have time, I mean, I have one more question. And, sure. and Sal, I, I've, I've kind of heard what your, uh, your take on supplements is. And I think I'm similar. I really like trying to experiment with a lot. Um, I know that they're not, you know, necessarily uh, necessary, but I guess, you know, all of the crap that's out there, um, I'm having a hard time differentiating between what's higher on the totem pole. So uh, to you guys, what supplements would you say, okay, this is highly recommended, maybe even close to mandatory, um, or, you know, what's kind of on the edge of, you know, this is really isn't necessary to, to what your goals are. Yeah. It's kind of fish oil. At the, top, at the top of the list are supplements to fill any nutrient requirements. So if your protein intake is low... A protein supplement may be a you're good idea. If you're deficient in anything. Yeah, if you're deficient in nutrient, then that would be an important thing to take. And then next up, creatine. Creatine is the best supplement all the way around, muscle building, fat loss, health. And then after that, uh, really nothing. Everything else is, I mean, you can have fun with it, um, but really nothing really moves the needle that much um, besides the ones I just listed. Don't neglect to look into what the first one Sal said, because I think you just kind of went over it real quick. But uh, if you haven't gone and had your blood work done and like a full panel and see if you're deficient in something like vitamin D, which is c- common sometimes or uh, iron, like there's a I, I think supplementing for what your body needs 
uh, it has tremendous value and is is grossly underrated. And I don't think fitness people talk about it enough. And to me, that's the first place I'm going to go first is to look if I have any sort of deficiencies or I'm not getting enough uh, of a nutrient. And then I'm going to supplement with that. And then I agree with Sal, then creatine is the first thing that I'm throwing on top totally. of that. Uh, and then the rest of the stuff is, it's kind of stuff that you can kind of play with and see if you notice a difference, but it is the supplements really are the, one of the smallest parts of the pie. Great. I appreciate all you guys do. And, uh, you guys definitely have helped me out in my, my fitness journey. Really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Awesome. Alex. Thanks, Thank Alex. you. Yeah, it's got to be one of the more common questions. Uh, you know, do I eat more or less on my training days? It really doesn't make a big difference. But it just depends yeah. on your feel. Like Adam and I are a great example. We're we're very different. Yeah, such individual variants there. Totally, and it you know actually I remember I would base off the studies. Oh, studies say I got to eat a lot more on training day, and I would just not listen to my body. And eventually, I said, well, you know, I feel better yeah. when I eat a little less on my training days and more on my rest days. I switched to that and it was so well, much better for me. This is another example of something that annoys me about our space is that, you know, they will, they'll, they'll somebody will make an argument, you know, that, oh, well, that technically this is better mm -hmm. uh, based off of this study. But if you're just a normal person who's trying to build muscle, trying to burn body fat, what's most important is what you're going to adhere to. Yeah. So if you have a if you have a hard time sticking to the, what what the study says is the best for protein synthesis or for strength or whatever, it doesn't matter if you're not going to stay consistent with that long term. It makes sense to me when you're at like a high level competitor. And you're like, you know, you're already doing everything, right? If you're competing, getting on stage, you're not missing workouts, you're not missing macros, like you're you're on it. And so tweaking like, oh, I'm going to try timing my meal or I'm going to try, you know, feeding more on these days. That that makes sense to me because you're- Because you've you're, already done everything. Yeah. So a half percent difference. Okay. Right. But yeah. I mean, for the general population that has, you know, normal goals like everybody has, uh, that's, you know, has good weeks, bad weeks, you know, consistency is everything. And so if I can- if I can find what works best for you, uh, that's where I'm gonna I'm gonna push you in that direction, it, it, regardless it, of what the study says. It literally reminds me of like it's like if you have a uh, I've used this car analogy before. You have a car, you want to make it faster, and so what do you you know you go to a super advanced NASA facility that measures the airflow over your car, and they're able to modify the design of the car so that you get two percent greater airflow over the you know, and that'll make you maybe a little faster. Or you could go, you know, put some headers <laughs> on there your, yeah, or engine. throw a turbo, you know, <laughs> like which one is going to be a bigger, a, a better, you know, time spent, right? So don't waste your time on the small stuff. Um, look at the big stuff first. Our next caller is Justin from Colorado. Justin, what's happening? Hey, Sal, how's it going? Good. Hey, great awesome. Name, hey, buddy. guys, I just want to uh, first start off by saying like everyone does, thank you so much for everything y'all do. I know I kind of wrote a little bit in my question, but been listening to you guys for the last nine months, haven't missed pretty much an episode. Um, and y'all are a huge inspiration in getting me uh, to the point where now I'm uh, personal training myself. So thank you for that. Cool. Awesome. Um, my question today has to revolve around training and training splits, um, specifically a, a couple different questions. Um, so I'm looking to get into physique competition, uh, being a men's physique competitor, doing a natural competition within the next probably 12 to 18 months. I want to give myself a good kind of training base to go off of, um, as well as I'm looking at potentially in the future after that, I'm taking on some com competition clients as well. Um, so I'm looking at uh, what training splits are for those. And I'm seeing with a lot of, you know, the top level guys, you see a lot of kind of bro splits, push, pull legs, upper, lower, but I don't see a lot of full body splits or full body workouts, which is what you guys I know uh, kind of push the most. So I was wondering what your opinions were um, as far as training, you know, natural and enhanced clients with um, full body splits versus going into something like more of a push, pull legs, um, yeah, and what what you guys had thought about that moving into um, into training actual competition clients? Yeah. Sorry, I know I said that a few times. I love this. So this is uh, I'm going to give a little little story here because this is kind of what led to the creation of Maps Anabolic. Mm -hmm. When you look at the the evolution of of muscle building type programs, what you see before the widespread introduction of performance enhancing drugs like testosterone, or actually the first anabolic steroid really used was Dianabol. Um, everybody did a full body workout. Everybody trained the whole body three days a week. 
as anabolic steroids became a bigger player in bodybuilding and physique enhancement, you started to see athletes switch more to splits. So the question is why? What is, what is it about the splits that the enhanced athletes liked versus the full body, which natural athletes uh, you know liked even more? Well, there's a couple differences. One, when you're anabolically enhanced, you have a very, very enhanced uh, recovery ability, which means you could train with a lot more volume and a lot more intensity. If you're doing a tremendous amount of volume, a full body workout can just get too long, right? So if I'm if I'm doing 15 sets per body part and I'm training my whole body on a Monday, <clears throat> man, I'm going to be working out for three hours. It's just it's just a very very long workout. So that's one. So they split it up so they could do a lot of volume without spending so much time in the gym at any you know given moment. So that's one thing. The second thing is that. When you work out with weights, you send a muscle building signal, and we can actually measure this with something called muscle protein synthesis, and we see that it spikes about 24 hours post-workout, and then it starts to dip at about 48 to 72 hours very rapidly, in which case it gets back down to baseline. So you work out on Monday, by the time Wednesday comes around, that muscle building signal really starts to drop off and disappear. Now, this doesn't necessarily happen to an enhanced athlete because they're taking a hormonal chemical muscle building signal. Like if you give a man testosterone, high doses of testosterone, and don't even have him work out, he'll build muscle just from the hormonal signal. Um, in fact, there was a study that compared natural lifters to men who didn't even lift weights and just took testosterone at high doses. And the men who didn't lift and took testosterone built a little bit more muscle than the guys who lifted who are natural. So when you have a loud hormone muscle building signal, you don't have to necessarily go back and send another muscle building signal as quickly as you do when you're natural. So natural people, natural athletes tend to build more muscle better with more frequency of training, hitting the whole body three days a week. Enhanced athletes can get away with one or two days a week of hitting uh, the entire body. Um, and of course, natural athletes can't handle the amount of re the amount of intensity and volume that enhanced athletes can handle. Now, that being said, I'll make this argument as well. I'll argue that enhanced athletes will also build more muscle, train the whole body three days a week. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that they train the whole body Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. They could still do a split, but they'll probably get better gains if they made sure to hit every body part three days a week, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, there are studies that compare this, and the studies do show that more frequency tends to, it, it trends towards more muscle and more strength. Now, the studies will show two days a week or two times a week for per body part is seems to be the best for hypertrophy, but if you actually look at those studies, what you find is that the three day a week or three times a week, although the hypertrophy isn't necessarily better, you see strength trend a little bit better. And my argument is the skill aspect of resistance training. If I can do, you know, if I'm doing 30 sets of squats and I'm doing it two days a week, so 15 sets twice a week versus 10 sets three days a week, the total volume is the same, but I'm practicing squats three times during that week and I'm practicing the skill of squats. And, and that is a very important component to success with resistance strength. So when we're talking to most people, most people, we tell them, full body workouts are best. Now we do have advanced bodybuilder style routines like MAPS split, uh, where you're doing more of a split type routine. Um, or even if you go extreme like MAPS PED, which is a split, a double split type routine. But yeah, for most people, especially natural, hit the whole body three days a week and you'll get the best results. Yeah, that way. I mean, everything we know about the CNS is about frequency and about like teaching your body, these movements, you get better at them. So from overall, from a quality perspective and in terms of performance, and I know, you know, w within the bodybuilder world or aesthetic world, you know, th this is sort of one of those things that doesn't seem to be considered enough. Um, but the more effective you are in the gym, uh, in terms of building strength, it, it actually promotes more muscle, uh, and to be able to disperse more of that volume throughout the week uh, so you can really focus in on some of these major lifts and have that kind of um, you know focus and attention specifically on the ones that that move the needle the most uh, you know for me it just it, it's an advantage that you have versus doing legs all in one day and like having poor quality towards the end of your workout 
Justin, I'm sure you've, if you've been listening to the show uh, long enough, you've probably heard me say my goal is always to do as little as possible to elicit the most amount of change. One of the biggest mistakes I see people that are interested in getting into competitive bodybuilding, men's physique, bikini, any of those, is they look to the athletes that are doing that or already been doing that for years, and they look at how they train, and then they go right into that. And I just think that's a terrible strategy. Um, you know, getting ready for competing, I spent about a year training uh, before I actually started prepping for the show. So and that, a lot of that was building my physique, building my metabolism, slowly scaling volume. And what it looked like was MAPS anabolic, MAPS performance, MAPS aesthetic, MAPS split, and then MAPS PED. It's like a, that's a year and a quarter, year and a half of training right there in itself. And the idea was that there's why would I jump all the way to PED? Just because my body can tolerate it or handle it, I'm not going to get the most results that way. I'm going to get the most results by doing as little as possible to elicit the most amount of change and slowly building volume over time. So my generic answer without knowing a ton of information about you would be that's how I would build my routine. It would be running a program like Anabolic right now, and I'm going to try and max out all the benefits from you know a program that's only a three-day-a-week type of training routine, and then I'm going to slowly scale that up. Uh, and that's how we kind of wrote the programs. I believe, too, I don't know if the, I'm sure maybe Doug can look this up or maybe Sal, you remember? You remember when you wrote down um, all the different pathways you would recommend based off of your goals? Did you do like a aesthetic bodybuilding one? Do you remember? I don't if, remember. Yeah. I mean, it would be what I just said. Yeah. But, I, you know, Sal put together this on a, the, the Mind Pump Media IG uh, for Chokey a, a couple of years ago, I think, for people when they ask questions like, hey, this is my specific goal. How would you follow your programs? And I know we have a bunch of them in there. I believe we did one for that. If not, it's what I just said. That's what yeah. you would follow is that type of a routine. Yeah. And, you know, Justin, it's interesting because of all of the uh, strength training or resistance training based sports, the only one that sometimes goes in this direction of each body part once a week is bodybuilding. You look at powerlifting, Olympic lifting, kettlebell, track, any other strength sport, it's about frequency. Now you ask yourself why? Because they're much more focused on skill than hypertrophy. So what does this mean for you who wants to be a bodybuilder? Well, borrow from them. I think it's, it's dumb to ignore that. And really this trend of training less frequency uh, of body parts didn't really happen until the 90s. Even in the 80s and 70s, they were doing body part splits and they were hitting the whole body two or three days a week. They were just doing so much volume, it didn't make sense to do the whole body in one day. They were in there six days a week, you know. I, uh, Which is what PED looks like. Yeah. yeah PED it, was written that way. It's yeah. our highest volume program like and, and we split it up like that. It is. And, and again, uh, you know, being enhanced with hormones allows your body to react, respond, and adapt differently than when you're natural. When you're natural, you overtrain, your testosterone goes in the floor. When you're enhanced, you overtrain, your testosterone's still high, right? You got a muscle building signal that's on all the time. When you're natural, it's on or off. And the goal is to keep it on more than off in order to build muscle. So those are the big things to consider. So if you're natural, I'd go full body three days a week. Uh, MAPS anabolic style, I think, would probably uh, be best. Okay. Shoot that, and, over. Shoot um, that over to him. Then, oh, sorry. On oh, um, one other... Um, small thing for you because I know you always say to kind of like whatever you're not doing now is usually going to be what's best for you moving forward. Does that include with doing uh, or differing up like your body part splits versus a full body would going into like I've been uh, running anabolic for the last three months. I just finished phase oh, three a I couple see. weeks ago. So would turning into something more like a push full legs or like a MAPS aesthetic work? No, um, no, no. Map, maps, is, ma maps aesthetic uh, would be just fine. Um, okay, so uh, we'll send MAPS aesthetic to you since you have MAPS anabolic. There's a lot of variables you can modify before you modify the split. Okay. Okay, so there's a lot of things we can look at before we go into, you know, a push pull uh, split or, a, you know, a even bigger split. And I, I mean, I, the, look, splits are fine. There's nothing wrong with splits. But here's, them. here's what I want you to, to remember. Uh, train the whole body, uh, whether you do it, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or five days a week or whatever, two or three days a week. That's, that's, that seems best for most people. Once a week is not enough for most people. And don't, don't be afraid to run. I mean, we have time, right? I think you told me well over a year that you're, you're, you're planning to do this, right? So this isn't like in a couple months. Right. So yeah. don't be afraid to run MAPS performance either because it is so different, especially somebody who has like a bodybuilding mentality. It'll be so unique to how you, you train right now that you're going to get great benefits for that. 
you're going to get tremendous benefits from it, and it'll be good to go away from a very traditional body part split type of a bodybuilder routine. Um, and I use that. That's how I use performance on my way of getting ready to compete was I interrupted the the bodybuilding mentality that I had in training and I followed performance and saw great benefits from it. So don't be afraid to run that program either. I think MAPS Aesthetic is fine and perfect. I think that's okay for us to go that way. But it's okay for you to throw in performance for you know a phase or for uh, a, a cycle and then move back into like the bodybuilding focus. Okay. All right. Awesome. Cool. Thanks for calling in, Justin. Yeah, of course. Thank you, guys. No problem. All right. Yeah, we haven't visited this in a while. We did it really early on because when we you know, first started with MAPS Anabolic, we knew this would be a big question. Mm-hmm. Although, I do see this becoming less of a controversial topic. I think when we first started seven years ago saying this, people were like, oh, full body. It's all about body. Oh, body. You're I know, seeing more people now get this, right? It's interesting because even in the sports world, so I, I had to kind of come in and and explain, uh, you know, to the to high school kids, like to to stop doing the, the body part splits, and they were doing that for performance reasons, and so it still persists, you know, in terms of like what people think is the first type of program they should do is a body part split. Our next caller is Rachel from Texas. What's up, Rachel? How can we help you? Hi, how are y'all today? Good. Um, I just had a question over training, and I'm kind of new to doing one of y'all's programs. So I started in November um, doing MAPS HIT, and I ran that through November and December and took a break um, during the holidays. And then I started up Anabolic in January. Uh, And I'm currently doing with friends. Prior to that, the friends that I'm doing with, um, we were online doing another platform. And we were probably hands down over training, um, at least personally I was. But some of the things that we did on that online platform, like HIT or cardio or um, burpees, you know, a lot more cardio intensive training, um, I miss. And I'm wondering how I can incorporate it, even if it's one day a week, or how I can incorporate it with my current program. Yeah. Did you? Are you wanting just to do it because you like doing burpees, or are you looking for the best results? Both. So I know that's hard, but I truly enjoy doing, I know that sounds dumb, but I truly enjoy doing that form of training. So I don't, I don't want to go back to my old ways. So okay. that's I'm for sure do not want to do. Well, it's, if, it's not dumb by the way. Yeah, it's a lot yeah, of people, no, a lot no, of people grab it. Common. No, if you like it, then you can throw it in on some of your off days. Not a big deal. Just don't overdo it and listen to your body. But if it's something you enjoy, and this is what we've always said this, look, all activities, so long as it's done appropriately. And what we mean by that is you can do any activity wrong. You can you can use it in a way to hurt yourself or overtrain, no matter what that activity is. But so long as it's appropriate and you're you're recovering, and you're not overdoing it, not hurting yourself. If you enjoy it and you actually get value out of it, just even if it's just quality of life, do it. I don't care what it is. Go for it. So if you enjoy it, do it on your off days. Now I'll add this: you're doing maps anabolic, but you like some of that other stuff, MAPS performance would be amazing. Mm -hmm. That program's got some unconventional exercises. Phase one's going to be similar to MAPS Anabolic, but you start to move into phase two, three, and then four. Mm -hmm. Three especially. Yeah, yeah, you're you're doing some of that stuff that you're talking about. You're just doing it in constructive, effective ways. So if you enjoy or appreciate that athletic aspect of it, the heart pumping, the cardio aspect, the conditioning, MAPS performance would be a program I think that you would enjoy. I do want to caution you though. Okay. It's just, and that's just because at least eight out of 10 of my clients that would say this, because it's actually a lot more common than you think. We're, we're addicted to the feeling they got after that way of training more than anything else, because you get this spike in cortisol and it feels amazing. It's like taking a shot of, of, of espresso or a double shot of it, right? And you get this energy rush from it and you're all sweaty and you feel accomplished. And so, but the, the truth is most times it's not what's best for my client for their, for the most results. So I just want to caution you that like I'm all for client. If I have a client that says, Adam, I love to go, you know, for a five mile run at least two or three times a week. It's like meditating for me and I enjoy it. It feels good. I could, I'll do it for the rest of my life. Go for it. I'm not going to tell mm-hmm. them not to do that, even if it's not what's best for their goals. I'm going to allow them to do it because I, I'm all for that. 
but I just want to caution you on being able to really understand what it is about burpees because I there's not a lot of people that really like doing burpees. I feel like you're lying. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, what it, well, I love them. In fact, like last March, the ladies that I currently am doing anabolic with, we did a challenge of how many burpees we can do in March. And we everyone did 2,000 to 3,000 burpees in March. Oh, so boy. like I, I truly enjoy them. Now, that was a bit overkill and it took a over my life. So it's not something I want to repeat, but I just want to throw them in every once in a while there's a, if there, necessary. So, so I, I hear your words that are coming out of your mouth, but I have a different, I, I feel like they're not, you're not a hundred percent honest either with us or with yourself. You loved it so much, but I think I overdid it and I don't want to do it again. Doesn't sound like they, they don't, they don't match. And so it, now I don't know, Rachel, but you sound a lot like a lot of people that I've trained who say this to themselves, but don't really mean it. Really what they're doing is they're trying to bolster or strengthen their a little bit of addiction to exercise. I get it. I'm the same way. So, and I'm not, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to defend yourself because I'm sure I'm probably making you feel like you have to. I'm just no, saying that's what it sounds like to me, or at least it's what it feels like. Well, listen, I taught. I if I don't know how much you know my history or how long you've been listening to the show, but you know, I got the opportunity to be a coach not that long ago. It was less than ten years ago um, at Orange Theory, where you have this circuit-based training. I'm not sure how familiar you are with it or not. I'm, I'm, I know Orange Theory. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, spent many, many hours uh, talking to guys and girls after classes that love to train this way, and. Uh, almost all of them, you know, what, what we call cortisol junkies. They, it's not so much the the class; it's the feeling that they get after. It's the I accomplished that. I'm sweating like crazy, and that was hard as shit. And I and I persevered, and I made it through it. And they felt so great. And they would tell me that, oh, Adam, I love that. I love to get my ass kicked and it feels so good afterwards. But then they're also, but I can't seem to lose this last 15 pounds I want to lose so bad. And it's I, and I assess their diet. I assess their routine and what they're doing. I'm like, well, it's because you're doing the wrong thing for with the results that you're trying to achieve. So that's the one thing I would caution you is make sure that your, your goals that you have align with what you're doing. Now, if you feel great, you like where your body fat percentage is, you like where your strength is at, and you enjoy doing burpees, or you enjoy doing hit cardio, you enjoy Orange Theory classes, and that's now become part of the hell yes, do it. Keep doing it. But if you have goals that you're you're trying to move your body, I want it to look a certain way, or I want to drop a certain amount of body fat percentage, or I want to add strength or build muscle, if you have specific goals like that, and you're stuck at a plateau, meanwhile, you're training this way, a lot of times, that is the reason why you're stuck. Mm -hmm. You're stuck because your body is not, well, your body's responding exactly how it should be, but you're sending the wrong signal to it based off of what your goals are. And so you have to just, so if you're okay with where you're at physically and you like where your body is at, you like where your strength is at, and then you also enjoy it, hell yeah, do the burpees, enjoy training hit stuff, that's, that's totally fine. But where I have a problem with it as a coach, when I assess somebody that they, they tell me they have this goal, Adam, I want to lose 15 to 20 pounds, or I want to drop my body fat percentage by 5%, or I, I want to add this much to my bench press and get stronger. And then they tell me this is how they're training. I go, well, yeah. you're, you're sending a, com a competing signal to your body. You're, you're, you're training it to be efficient at working out hard and really good at it. You're not training it to build muscle. You're not training it to lose body fat. Now, you may think that way because you're sweating your ass off and it feels like you did a lot, but your body is getting adapted to that way of training and it's not showing you the results you want. And this is where clients get stuck and they get, and they get in a plateau. It's a psychological challenge. That's right. That's, a very, That's my biggest problem yes. is the mental struggle that I want to do it, but that I don't know. Obviously, I was doing it not right before and too much of it. So I want to do it, but I also want to, I do have body goals that, and I want to lean out just a little bit. I build muscle very easily. Yeah. And so I just want to lean out. But so I'm worried if I throw in one day a week that I'm mentally going to want to keep going more. Cause I do like the feeling. I do like the feeling of accomplishment of challenging myself. You can of come being, back to it. I guess is the, is um, the point. This is not something that you need to completely abandon. Um, but if you want to really dive into something that your body's going to have a new 
uh, response to and, and a new stimulus towards like it, you got to cha- challenge yourself to really psychologically place yourself uh, and find the benefits of the other side of the training and focus on that. I mean, I go through this. We all go through this because I'm a creature of habit. I like a certain way of training. I like only doing one to five reps. I hate doing, you know, super sets and I hate doing bodybuilder style training. But you know what? There's periods where I want to just focus on challenging myself to respond differently and change my body. If you really want change, you know, that's just something that you have to consider. Well, also, Rich, where are we at? Do you have any idea where you're at calorie wise? Do you, are you tracking anything nutritionally where you're approaching it? Do, you, do we know any of this? Yeah, so I was. Um, I started tracking November and December, and um, I was not in November. I, I was not eating enough. I was around like 1,400, 1,500 calories. So uh, when I started listening to y'all in October, I realized that error <laughs> of my eating was probably not right. So I started tracking, and then I started slowly pushing my protein up and my calories up, and I probably got to like 18, 1900. Okay, okay. So this, so if you were, if if you were my client. And and you and you you gave me the green light to truly coach you, and you said, Adam, I'll do whatever you tell me. I trust you. You seem like a smart guy. I'll follow whatever you're saying, even if I don't really want to do it right now. But I I trust the process. I'd say, okay, Rachel, what I want to do with you right now is I want to purely focus on trying to build your metabolism. I want to build strength. I want to get a strong, healthy metabolism that's working for you. That you you get up to a place where maybe we're eating 23, 2400 calories and not putting any body fat on, that would be the desired outcome right now. And then I would say, once I get you there, then we can start incorporating your, your kickboxing and incorporating your burpees and incorporating some of these high intense things that you enjoy to do. And not only that, when you get to go back and do that, your body's going to respond the way you want it to respond based off the effort that you're putting forth. If you go and start to incorporate that stuff right now, when we're only about about 1,400 to 1,600 calories, your body then is going to revolt. It's going to say, oh man, she's barely feeding me anything and she's beating the shit out of myself. It's going to conserve energy and it's not going to burn body fat like you want it to. So if we want if we want to have our cake and eat it too, if we want to be able to train this way that you want and you're going to be able to shred body fat and kind of get both the best of both worlds, then we first need to do, we need to do the things that we have to do now so we can do the things that we want to do later, which right now what you need to do is to build your metabolism is to strength so strength train something traditional like a 3 to 4 to 3 to 4 time a week full body routine I would actually follow anabolic right now based off of what we know now and then maybe go into performance after that but I would I would follow that and the goal the mindset that I would want you to have is let's get stronger Let's get stronger and see if we can slowly increase our calories without doing all this crazy other high intensity stuff. And then, and and we would set a goal together. I'd say, okay, let's agree that we're going to get you up to that 2,300 calorie mark without putting any body fat on. And then when we reach that, whether that takes us three months or eight months, depending on how consistent and how much your body responds, then we can start to play with the things that you really enjoy doing that are more intense based. That way you you can have your cake and eat it too. That way you can incorporate these high intense uh, training sessions with also losing body fat. Otherwise, if you introduce it to you right now where you're probably still just barely recovering since it wasn't that long ago when you were training this way anyways, your body's not going to respond the way we want to. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So if I'm in phase three of anabolic, I know I've heard y'all say you can run it in a loop. Would y'all just start over? Yeah, actually, if you're doing it already, uh, I think Maps Performance would be fine, and I think you'll have a lot of fun with Maps Performance. I agree. So we'll, we'll okay, send we'll send over Maps there. Performance to you, okay, Rachel? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Stay in touch with us. Let us know how it goes. Okay, thank you. All right, Rachel. Bye-bye. Yeah, she's not being honest with herself. There's, <laughs> well, I mean- Well, that's why I went you know, that You know what the challenge is here? The challenge with doing these calls is if this was a client of mine, mm-hmm. I wouldn't tell her right out the gates, you're not being honest with yourself. It's not going to work. It would be a long conversation over over right, right. sessions, you, you but lead her to that. Yeah, I'm not going to. I mean, this could. I know I'm going to be a little harsh here, but here's a few things that she said. Uh, one, she's got a history of overtraining. Two, ooh, I love burpees; they're so awesome. But looking back, I was too much, and I probably shouldn't have done it. I'm not going to do it again. Yeah. Three, I was eating 1,400 calories. What we're dealing with is a, an individual that is struggling with a little bit of an addiction to exercise, which is quite common, and she's not being quite honest with herself. She does. She love it. No, she loves the addiction to it, um, and it's not working for her. And it's probably the last thing she needs to do for herself. And 
again, this is a, a longer process, and I know it's going to make her, you know, talking to her this way is just going to strengthen that and make her kind of defend herself. She's, but she, the truth is, it's it's she's it's all wrong. It's not good for. Well, and the then association she's got her, of just moving that intensively is always about burning fat, yeah. and I think that's where, like, you know, I have the biggest issues because I had a lot of clients like this. Like, I have to keep this though, and I love it because it's burning and, my fat while I'm also trying to build muscle. And, and I'm like, going to tell you this, and I know you guys have experienced this. Some of the hardest people to convince this of are women in groups of other women that do these challenges together. Yeah, that, and she meant when she just mentioned that I was like, oh shit, this is gonna be a tough one. Like, yeah, oh, me and my girlfriend, my wife out of a group like, yeah, that. me and my <laughs> girlfriend did this burpee challenge. You, you know, yeah, you like, just whatever. talked about that not that long ago. Yeah, right? yeah. I mean, she was into cardio, kickboxing, and 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 we were trying to get them to run maps program, and they just turned it into a big cardio fest. And I'm like, you're out. <laughs> Okay, you gotta do this on your own. <laughs> you're cut out. Yeah, it's, you cut it, out. Let them figure it, it's it out. It's really hard. They're part of a group. Everybody's suffering together. And, and what they, you know, they, there's definitely value in working out together and that camaraderie. But no, she's well, lying to herself. I mean, I, I'm, glad you, I, I'm glad you started uh, from the, the compassionate side first of, hey, if you love doing these things, sure. like, I'm never going to. But I, you know, it. it played out the way I thought it was going to play out, which is, you know, because it is at least 80 to 90 percent of my my clients that would make this claim that they love burpees, which that yeah. was rare. But, the, you know, the ones that would say this or love the hard circuit training, they 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 think they attach it to results. They actually right. think it's what's best for their body. And they also they're not receiving those. You, what else is common? We actually didn't get into it with her, but, you know, maybe she'll get a chance to listen to this and she can assess even further. But it's very common with my clients that are sleep deprived, low low calorie, Dude, yes. high stress. It's all part of the same package. How because many times how many times do you have someone come up to you, one of these clients, and they've got the dark circles, yeah. they're weathered, they're sweaty from the workout they just, just came did, back from an injury. And they're like, oh, but I feel so good. Well, so you have to explain why that is, right? Oh, well, if, look, your, your body starts to become a little resistant to some of these stress hormones yeah. because you're hammering your body with stress hormones. So this little extra boost of stress hormones that you get from stressing the shit out of your body Starts to make you feel good. And then you got to throw caffeine on it. And then you got to do more of this intense stuff. And then the fear is if I stop beating myself up, oh my God, I'm going to gain all this body fat. Mm -hmm. It's a very tough position to be in. And you will lie to yourself. And that's exactly what she's doing. I mean, when she says, I love it, it's so great. But looking back, it wasn't good for me and I shouldn't do it. Huh? Which I want to, again, it, and we said this, but I just want to reiterate it's if she was at a place where she was happy. She was not trying to get stronger. She wasn't trying to lose body fat. She just, yeah. she is, just did it for the enjoyment of it. Yeah, she's not trying to change. Like she's not trying to change anything. Yeah, keep doing what you're doing. Then keep doing it. Yeah. I got nothing wrong with that. And you know, eating 1600 or so calories, not a bad place. Could be better, but not a bad place. Yeah. And doing what you love, having the body you want, having the strength and energy you want. Mm -hmm. That there, I have nothing. I'm nothing against anybody doing marathons with doing burpees with doing high intense stuff. Yeah. So long as they they love everything about it. But what always happens is I get someone who tells me I love all these intense, crazy things, but then I also want my body to change, yeah. and I can't figure out why it's not. Well, let me tell you why it's not. It's because, you, like you said, you're stressing the shit out of your body, and the feeling you get that you think is that you, this accomplishment, if that's cortisol spiking. It mm -hmm. gives you this uh, this little high. It keeps you going. And it feels, really, it feels really good, but it's not what the body needs to see the change that you want. And so... You're in this, you know, weird predicament of I know that stuff makes me feel good when I when I do it, but I also realize yeah. now it's not what's best for my body. And the first program, didn't you say the first program that she hit. did was Matt? Of course, hit. Yeah, of course, she did. Matt that's why we didn't. Yeah. That's why we we waited yeah. so long, and it comes with a warning. You know, I hate to say that this sounds arrogant, but you know, when you train people for decades, you start to see common There's commonalities, yeah. and she, and this is a very common avatar and persona of a client that would do well and say exactly what she said 85 to 90 percent of my clientele yeah I, I will say this though and and it um it does make me feel good because here we here we knew what we waited to put hit out for a long time because we were afraid that it would do nothing but attract the wrong people yeah the wrong yeah. people are going to want to do but that what is her. great is that look here we are having a conversation with her That's so right. it mm -hmm. it got her in because she saw oh this is the way i like to train mm -hmm. And then she's listened to the show and she started to piece together. Maybe this is not what's best. Yeah. And now here we are on a phone call. And so hopefully we can set her on the right track. But I tell you what, if you're listening right now and maps hit, 
was the thing that attracted you to it. If it was the first program you bought at ours, you might want to question <laughs> if you're in the same boat because We're it's- We're going to have a hard conversation with that's you. That's right. Like it's, it's, a, it's very common. She's way more common than she probably thinks she is. A yeah. lot of people- And, and this we, is why her mindset team. is shifting, so there's progress there. So that's we right. can highlight that, and hopefully yeah, she, she yeah. goes through the program. And if people only knew how at odds we were with our marketing uh, team sometimes, because we tell people uh, not yeah. to do <laughs> these popular programs that we could sell the shit out of if we just totally. lied a little bit. Yep. Our next caller is Ian from North Carolina. What's up, Ian? How can we help you? Hey there. Very nice to meet you guys. I wanted to say two quick things. First, I wanted to say a huge thank you from all the people that you are impacting their lives in a positive way, for which you should all be very proud. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. We're I super proud that. of ourselves. <laughs> <Stop>. <laughs> Ruined it, Sal. Yeah. And uh, the second is, I listen to you guys um, at like 2x speed on the podcast, so hearing your voices like this is like hearing in slow motion. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to speed it up for you. No problem. All right. There you go. My uh, question is, um, I need to map, run MAPS performance three times, and should I do it phase one three times, then phase two? Or should I go through the whole thing and just start over? Yeah, that's well. that's actually a very easy one to answer. But can I ask you uh, what's with the three times? Is there a reason why? Yeah, why why ask this question? Well, I I guess I should step back a little bit. Um, I started listening to you guys. I don't know about three years ago, and um, if you came to me and you said you're working out ten times too much, and while you're working out, you're resting a hundred times too little, and you're also eating half as much as you should. I would have thought you guys are out of your minds, but that's pretty much true um, across every point. I was doing everything wrong. So um, I listened a while and I uh, got anabolic and I started following it, but I was still doing too much. I was doing too much trigger. I was doing too often and um, I was getting results, but not great results. And I think I was listening to one of the podcasts and, listening to uh, the one where you're talking about the five by five. So I decided to try it. And so all I did was squat dead overhead, pull up bench. And I did just at 125 reps. And for whatever reason, I, I was only hitting workouts every fifth day. And I just saw like a light switch just went off and I finally got to the adaptive stage. So it finally started to make sense. So even in anabolic, I did the pre-phase for like three months. You guys say three weeks, but I mean, I'm learning these exercises, even though I've been an athlete my whole life. Um, all of this stuff was new. So now I'm going into performance and this stuff is all so new. Uh -huh. um, for instance, um, when I did a Turkish get up the first, first rep, I had to take a nap because it was just so, so new. Hmm. So that's why I'm, that's kind of why I'm asking, should I really focus on perfecting the movements and, and getting through each phase correctly and, and right? Or should I just go through the whole thing? That's a really cool. Okay. Now this is a yeah. cool question. I like that. And I like, I like that mentality. I do like the mentality too. That makes a lot more sense now why you would even want to do something like that. And I think that's a uh, great advice for a lot of people listening, because I think sometimes people just move from, you know, program hop, you know, all the time and they don't ever spend enough time getting good at some of the movements and that's where the with the the gains and the results really start to pile on as you get better at it yeah now that being said um you'd be better off just running through it and then starting over and running through it yeah. and you, you'll get the same benefits of getting better at it and practice it plus uh you're, you're not getting stuck in the same uh, rep range and phase for too long to where you see diminishing yeah, results. yeah there, there's a there's a bit i think there's a little bit of a misconception Ian, that you think that phase one is easier than phase two and phase three that's progressing you from less hard to more hard or less challenging to more challenging that's not how the phases work they're just different forms of adaptation. Yeah, different pursuits. Now, MAPS Anabolic's different because pre-phase is literally designed to get people ready to do MAPS Anabolic. And I did that because that was the first MAPS program. We didn't have MAPS Starter. We didn't have MAPS Resistance back then. It was just MAPS Anabolic. And I said, well, you know, somebody goes right into phase one, but they haven't been, you know, lifting weights. Like, they need to practice some of these lifts for a little while first. And that's why I created pre-phase. But with MAPS Performance, it's not like that. Phase one, two, three, four, they're all... Different. They're all good. They're all different. You're not you're not progressing in the sense that you know you're going from easier to harder. They're just totally different. So 
I would go through it as it's laid out and then go through it again as it's laid out. Now, one thing you're going to find is a lot of similar movements in each of the phases. So you're going to be practicing some of the most important, you know, movements throughout the whole program. So don't worry about, you know, the lack of practice type of deal. And then the last thing I'd like to ask is has to do with your diet and sleep. You said you tried a Turkish get up and you had to take a nap. <laughs> um, so you, 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 there's something, something's going on here or you worked out once every five days and you got good results. That tells me that your recovery isn't super mm. great. And that might have to do with other factors like stress or sleep or hormones or something like that. Am I ringing mm. some bells here? Um, maybe I think it was, you know, really I was just doing too much. I mean, when I was training to, to put in perspective, I was doing, I was running, I guess the equivalent of running one to two marathons a day, five times a week, and then racing on the weekends. Oh, I mean, it was, it was just, yeah, way, way too much. Wow. So now are you doing yeah. anything like that now while you're following mass performance? No, I, I mean, literally I just walk and I do performance oh. every fifth day. I mean, it was really when I went to the fifth, every fifth day that I allowed my bad body to adapt. Yeah. That's when I saw, I mean, and the thing that like triggered is my appetite just went through the roof. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How long, how long were you doing that crazy regime for of the running a marathon every day? Uh, well, that was at the height of it. So, I mean, I was doing triathlons after I finished, I was a, originally a swimmer and I did swimming in college and all of that. And then, um, as you would call it, I did, um, you know, weightlifting, with aerobics or speed weightlifting. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, so strength training is like a completely new shock to the system. Yeah. And it sounds oh, like, God, yeah. and it sounds like you had to give your body a little time to recover from what you were doing before. Yes. I think it, it really yeah. took my body time to, to recover and kind of say, my, my body was basically saying, Oh really? You're going to let us, you know, recover and actually adapt. <laughs> and, and it wasn't until it actually just like, okay, we'll let you do it. Oh, well, excellent. Well, well yeah. you're in a great place now. This is exciting. Yeah, it is. I, and again, follow it the way it's laid out and just go through it, you know, two or three times. I think that's the best way to do it. Okay. So you, you think that even though I'm going like every four or five days, um, that uh, they'll be able to, to really learn the exercises and not necessarily, because you guys talk about the CNS connection and, and sort of learning the movements. Okay. So I'm going to give you some other advice and try this instead of going once every five days and you're not doing mm -hmm. an additional workouts, right? You said you're just walking. Yeah. Walking and trigger or, you know, just the, 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 the minor, um, Got it. actually I, I do, um, mobility stuff on mobility the other sessions. days. Okay. So yeah. instead of once every five days doing a foundational workout, do them Monday, Wednesday, Friday and reduce the intensity. Okay. Just re reduce the intensity a lot. Yeah. Um, and that way you could do the frequency of the workouts. Yeah. So it, it, that's, and that will probably feel b better on your body than keeping high intensity with less frequency. And and you already have the right mindset and thought process of like, you you know, you want to get good at these movements. So just think that way as you're going to back off the intensity so much. Don't worry about it. If it's not mm -hmm. super heavy or really hard, that's okay. You, you're trying to practice. You want to get good at the movements. I think if you, you scale way back on the intensity, yeah. uh, you could easily do three times a week and not be anywhere near overtaxing your body. Uh, and you're gonna get you're gonna get better at the movements a lot faster. I think I think you'll see some great results from that. I would love Ian. Are, are you on Facebook by chance? Not much, but um, well, you have, have heard about your form. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're, I'm gonna have Doug get you in there, so we'll we'll add you for free, so we can. And I'd love to kind of hear your process as you're going through. That way, you can reach out to us and let us know what you're noticing, or if you have any questions along the way. Um, I'll have Doug give you free access to that. And then if you could try and stay in touch with us, maybe every couple of weeks or whatever, just let us know how you're doing and, and what's going on. And if we need to make any sort of subtle tweaks, we can along the way. Sure. That sounds great. Thank right, you sir. very much for the advice. Thanks for calling in, Ian. All right, Ian. Thank you. All the best. Yeah, I think I think he went from yeah crazy well, training yeah, yeah. to resistance shock. training. Yeah. And the reason why he started responding after training once every five days, he finally gave his body time to recover from what he was doing. Well, before. it's funny, like the Turkish getup, it doesn't like look that crazy in yeah. terms of like, but it just requires yeah. so much focus. And you're, I could see how that would be like, uh, you know, a real shock to the body to where it'd fatigue you. Oh, yeah. Especially if you've never done it. I mean, shit, I've said this before in the podcast that uh, there'd be times when that would be my workout. I just practiced. I'd do five mm -hmm. sets of yeah. practicing the Turkish get up. It literally and, involves like everything. Yeah. Yep. And you yep. can actually get a decent workout just doing that. So, but I love, I, I you know, you got to love 
hearing that about somebody who was running triathlons yep. and marathons and, and kind of hammering his body, coming to the realization that he's probably way over training, scaling all the way back to where he's only training once every five days and boom, all of a sudden the body responds. Yep. I mean, if that isn't like an aha moment for you, I don't know what would be. Yep. And then the path that he's on, the direction he's going and the thought process of, I want to get good at these movements and and having that attitude going into this routine. Mm -hmm. Very excited to see where this guy's yeah. at in six months to a yeah, year. Yeah, but I would say Definitely. if you're over training, uh, the first thing to reduce is intensity. Right. That would be the first place I would look. Then you can look at volume and then frequency. No, that's good because like he said, like you want to get good at it, so you want to keep repeating yep. movements, but just bring the intensity down allows you to do that and get good at and it. And people don't realize that you <laughs> the workout can still be very effective even if you're not sweating your right. ass off or struggling yeah. to Grunting move. Grunting and yeah. like, yeah. Like struggling, struggling to move through. the weight. So, no, great. That was great advice. Yeah, totally. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any fitness or health goal. You can also find us on social media, right? So Justin and Adam are both on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, Adam at Mind Pump Adam, and you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal.